Good evening and welcome to the Thursday, March 12th, 2020 meeting of the Northampton School Committee. I'm Mayor David Narkowitz. Um, this meeting is being um, video and audio recorded. I'll begin by asking the clerk to call the roll of the school committee. Member Susan Voss? Here. Member Seraphie Cox? Here. Mayor David Narkowitz? Present. Member Levy? Here. Member Kaufman? Here. Member Goldman? Here. Member Gold? Here. Member Condon? Here on the phone? Yes. <laughs> Member Pusansky. Present. Your Honor, you have a quorum. Thank you. And I did want to um, announce to the public that um, Member uh, Sean Condon is participating remotely this evening, so he's um, on the speaker phone. So um, the first item on our agenda is the public comment period. And we have um, a couple folks signed up. If I would ask you to just come to the podium and state your name uh, for the record, and I will have a timer for three minutes. Um, First person signed up is Kim Gerald. Uh, Kim Gerald, uh, 66 Pines Edge, Jackson Street, ESL teacher. I'm going to share a letter that uh, was we sent to the superintendent yesterday, signed by uh, 28 uh, staff members at Jackson Street School, and then add a few comments. Um, so here we go. We appreciate your dear Dr. Provost and Ms. Safran. I don't know if I'm saying her name correctly. Uh, we appreciate your communications with the school community about the preparedness measures that are going to be implemented to keep students and staff relatively safe from contracting the coronavirus. As school staff members that are in the high risk group by virtue of age or other underlying medical conditions, we would like to share some concerns. As you said, Dr. Provost, in your note to staff, uh, school employees are most at risk of contracting and spreading the virus to others. Those of us in the high-risk groups are more at risk of becoming seriously ill and are more at risk for fatalities. Several of us also take care of family members who are also elderly or have other serious health factors. I am in both of those groups. With the lack of testing available and the long incubation period, it's highly possible that people with the coronavirus are already in our school communities. The CDC advises people over 60 and those with health issues to avoid unnecessary gatherings and to minimize exposure to large groups. In a public school, we are exposed to large groups all day long. This new virus increases, increases exponentially, and so far the research shows that the only effective measures have been extreme social distancing, more than six feet. We would like to hear more about how the schools plan to advocate not only for the students and their families, and already Dr. Provost and, and people who have been meeting together are looking at this, um, how you're going to protect the students, the families, the employees, and particularly those in highest risk categories. If a staff member feels the need to self-quarantine, will there be support from the district? Will employees be forced to use up their own sick time? Or as the MTA advocates, will some kind of paid administrative leave be made available? We are glad the district is trying to make schools as sanitary as possible, but the reality is that all of us are among large numbers of children and adults on a daily basis, and COVID-19 is extremely contagious. Those of us who are older have given many years of our lives to our district and the children. We would like to hear how you plan to protect and advocate for us during the crisis. Um, if we followed, that's the letter, if we followed the mayor's wonderful uh, recommendations to his department heads, uh, schools would be closed. We can't, we, we have groups bigger than 20, bigger than 50, bigger than 100, six feet does not work in the schools. Um, the colleges are closing, many public schools in Eastern Mass, Connecticut's <laughs> getting ready. We should close our schools if truly the health and safety is the most important thing. Just one more thing. I understand that disruptions will be horrendous. Economic nutrition, I get that. But health disruptions, people becoming severely ill, our medical system being overwhelmed, and people dying is more disruptive. Thank you. Thank you. 
the next person who signed up is Amy Martin. Good evening. Thank you, Kim. And I know this is an extraordinary time, you know, a time that none of us have ever lived bo through before and that you are wrestling with enormous questions that there are no clear answers for. So this is not about the coronavirus. Um, I'm here um, with uh, Tricia Loomis and Tom Schiff. We are all amongst the 85 parents who sent a letter to you as well this week on a different topic. Um, we were a group of parents, caregivers, and town residents who care, uh, like all of you do, passionately about our students and our schools. And our letter, um, which thank you, Dr. Provost, for acknowledging so quickly, um, was about the concerns we have uh, in regards to the response of the district to the incredibly tragic death of Nevea Molina, who is a 16-year-old student at the high school, as I'm sure you all know. Um, we want all of our students and all of the people in the schools to have the time uh, to be together to honor the sadness that so many people feel at Nevea's death. We want um, all of the district to be able to be together to learn how to manage times of crisis together. We feel like the school has an incredible role to do teaching and modeling about how to be a compassionate community at times of crisis, and there are so many, unfortunately, um, but this one in particular about death and dying is something that we all struggle with and have a hard time with in this uh, culture and society. Uh, in this community, we feel like we can do better than, than the high school has done thus far. Um, and we also feel like there are systemic issues that you are all well aware of around racism, sexism, and violence that the schools can do better about teaching and modeling together how to have a compassionate, just response. Um, so we wanted to be here tonight to um, acknowledge all that you are managing and handling and to ask that you put on your agenda um, as soon as makes sense and as you're able to time to have a robust discussion about our letter to you uh, so that we can get a measured response from you when you have the time to, to think about these issues and let us know your thoughts about what could be done better in our community. Thank you. I appreciate your time and the hard work that you're doing and, and hope to hear from you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak in public comment? Andrea Gito. My name is Andrea Gito. I am the Unit A Chapter Coordinator for the Northampton Association of School Employees. And I have to be honest, walking into this room made me feel a little upset. <laughs> um, I appreciate the time that was taken to create a safe space with social distancing for the people here tonight. School committee members, I'm glad you're all being safe. The audience is sitting far apart from each other. It's a very clear message that our schools are not being given the same courtesy. Our students, our staff are not being given the courtesy of social distancing. And so I was thinking about what my comments were going to be to you tonight. And originally, my only comments were going to be about Dr. Provost's email to staff about their own you know, choices to self-quarantine and the fact that staff will be required to use their own sick time. And he graciously said he would waive the access to the sick leave bank if, our, if our, any staff members needed that once they had exhausted all their sick leave. What we know is that people don't want to exhaust all their sick leave to stay home. So someone who may feel that they need to self-quarantine, whether it's because of exposure or whether it's because of their own health issues, may or may not make the best choice for themselves and the community at the cost of losing all of their sick time. That's a scary situation for people to be in. With that being said, when I walked into the room and saw the social distancing happening here, and I've heard the mayor's recommendations about social distancing, and it's happening in our uni colleges and universities, I thought to myself, why are our students and staff in our public schools not given that same courtesy? And I understand that nutrition and feeding those that may have food insecurities is very important. 
But what I know about Northampton is that we could make that work. I know that the community could figure out a way, and I'm sure that our school employees would be a big part of helping with that solution, a way to feed those that may not have food. We offered a lunch program in the summer. There has to be some grants out there. There has to be people that we can talk to. I understand that the state didn't give us the waiver that we needed to provide lunch nutrition to our students, but I can't imagine that there's not a way in Northampton that we could make that work. And I behoove you to, to help us all come together and figure out a solution to that. The social distancing that's happening here and around our community should be afforded to our students and staff in the schools. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak in public comment? Okay. Um, hearing none, um, I was going to um, actually ask, just given the situation, whether or not we would have the superintendent give his report at the beginning of the meeting, um, since I know that it's going to be primarily about uh, COVID-19, and, and um, I thought that might be more important rather than putting it off to the end of the meeting. So if you want sure. to go ahead and do that. And I guess I will say that I also don't have a, haven't had the opportunity to organize my thoughts very much around this because I've been actually working the issue. So I'll be somewhat extemporary, extemporary whatever the word is, because I'm tired too. <laughs> Just making up as I go along. Um, so, yeah, the COVID issue has been probably the the sole issue that I've been working on for the past week with the, sh the little minor exception of a meeting that I was able to take at the high school with Eleanor. Um, this has been this has been the concern. Um, this is a very rapidly evolving situation. The recommendations are changing from hour to hour. Um, I can tell you that I'm spending most of the time in my working day with our director of public health and our director of health safety and equity for the schools. Um, we are also working with a number of other agencies, including the Department of, of Elementary and Secondary Education. As noted in the letter that Andrea Gito just referenced. We were also um, attempt, attempting to work with um, the Department of Education and also the Department of Agriculture to obtain a waiver to be able to feed students in the event that schools needed to be closed. Um, unfortunately, Northampton doesn't fall into that waiver. Um, so there are areas that have been designated as high food insecurity zones within the state which are allowed to operate the type of summer program that you were um, just referencing within the context of the school year. Um, Northampton is not in that, does not fall into one of those areas, so we don't have permission um, to distribute food outside of the summertime program. So um, a lot has been said about bringing um, people together and finding a way to, to be able to feed students. Uh, the, communication that I sent to families tonight, I wanted to be clear that we don't know that that's going to be a possibility because I want families to stock up on food and make whatever uh, arrangements they can in the event that school lunch is not one of the options for their students. But that makes me feel really bad because I know that a lot of these families really don't have those options. Um, so I'm saying, you know, Essentially, we may be locking our doors, good luck on your own, and that feels really horrible for a position to me as a superintendent. Um, I can tell you that we do have an algorithm for response. People have wondered, you know, have we thought through all the different possible um, scenarios and what the response would be. I'm not going to go through them all, but just to show you, we do have thought of all the different um, possible scenarios and what we think the appropriate response for the district should be. Um, but this is something that is evolving too. Uh, there is a conference call tomorrow morning at 8.30 with the commissioner. There may be new information that comes from that. I don't have any specific reason to believe that there's new information that will be coming for that, but I do know that there have been a, a couple of states that have completely closed public education um, this afternoon. 
So um, that is one potential outcome. I ha had a emergency meeting with our tech department and with the administrators at the end of the day today, um, preparing for the possibility of moving to online instruction because the reality is if we close, I don't know when we'll be open to again, right? What we know, what the medically available facts are, are right now we have no infection in the community. Now there's a question about whether or not there could be some because the testing situation is so constrained, right? But when we think about the possibility of initiating a school closure at a time when there's no infection, it's hard for me to think that we would say, okay, we will be able to reopen two or three weeks from now when it's likely that there's no infection raging through the community. So um, one of the things that we are preparing to do for students in sixth through 12th grade is to send them home with their electronic devices at the end of the day tomorrow if we get the notification or make the decision that we're closing school. Um, I will also be, it, in the, unless the commissioner or, or health department tells us that we can't get together as a faculty next week, bringing in faculty to work with our tech department to do training on online distance learning so that we can continue to provide some education for students in the event that school's closed. Um, it, it, I, I need to be clear, the recommendation this time coming from all of our departments is not that, to do a school closure, which is why we're not closed. Um, we, um, the MIAA, people have been asking about sports. Um, we made a decision to delay our determination on whether or not we were canceling spring sports because we knew that we had a week before the start of the spring season anyways. Um, a few minutes before this meeting, MIAA sent out notification that it's delaying the start of the spring sports season to March 30th. Um, initially with a possibility that they may be canceling sports across the state. So um, that they're, they're sort of in the same situation of not recommending closing at this time, but possibly thinking that closing may be needed. So the, the place where we really are right now is following the advice coming from the CDC at this point which has to do with self-quarantining for individuals who may have been exposed to isolating individuals who have had a confirmed exposure. Um, in, even if we don't have an across the board determination that we need to close, we would still, in, according to our protocol, do a short term school closure if we had a student who tested positive or who was presumptive positive. Um, or if we had a student who was symptomatic and had a potential exposure. Um, we do have some other scenarios that would lead to a school closure um, short term. If we had a teacher or staff who was symptomatic and had potential exposure, or, I'm sorry, that would be, let me just go through that. If we had a teacher or staff who had uh, tested positive, that would lead to a school closure, or a teacher or staff who was presumptive positive, that would lead to a school closure and all of those um, scenarios what we're envisioning is closing the school doing a deep cleaning which would take probably three to five days and then reopening once we were able to be assured that the school had been sanitized so the, these are the issues that we're weighing right now um, I I really would like to figure out a solution for the the feeding I'm concerned. People have said you can use volunteers. I'm somewhat concerned about that. One of the things I said in meetings with department heads is they can't be volunteers or then I can't give them student names. <laughs> so I need them to be employees. Um, so there may be a way to work that out. I don't know. Um, I'm also concerned also just with respect to our employees of hire of bringing in volunteers to do work that they're hired to do. Um, so there's that concern as well. Um, but then I also have the concern of having different levels of employees at different, different statuses within um, a closure model. So if we say we're closed, 
because we don't want groups of people congregating, but then say we want our food service staff to come in to prepare lunches and serve them, then part of that message is that, well, it's okay for them to be exposed. So they're just a, a never-ending series of conundrums that we're working through. Um, and much like the last public speaker said, there are really no answers for any of these. Each, each solution leads to another problem. All I can say, um, and I hope that it has come through in my communications, both to the staff as well as to families. I'm trying to navigate this really unprecedented situation in the way that respects the best interests of all. It's just very difficult because sometimes the interests are clashing with each other a little bit. Um, so, and I'm also thinking of the, the, lar the health of the larger community. Um, is we could be doing things within our schools that may be relatively safe for us, but may be um, potentially more harmful for other individuals, right? Because we know this virus um, impacts young people much less severely than it impacts the elderly or people with underlying health conditions. So um, that's, that's what I can say. Um, I, I promise that I'll do an update tomorrow after my communication on that conference call with the commissioner. Whatever, whatever the result is that comes out of that, just so that you can know where we are. I've worked really hard to try to keep the community up to date as each sort of progression of our thinking on this has, has moved forward, and I will continue to do so. I really can't predict where this is going to end, but I, I can commit that I will do my best to try to keep you all informed and, and know that I have your, your health and safety foremost in my thoughts as I'm making my decisions. Thank you, Dr. Roberts. Um, I would, would you allow questions? Sure, I sure. think since this is an unprecedented sure. situation. Yeah. And, I, and I, if I could just also say that, you know, from the city's perspective, we've been obviously focused on citywide issues and we've been focused on um, working with our regional partners, but we've also been in close communication with the schools. You know, we had a coordinated meeting today with not only because we have two school districts, not just NPS, but also Smith Voke, um, which has its own issues relative to its population being so spread out across Western Mass. Um, and so we've been, you know, I think tomorrow morning will be a fairly pivotal point in this conversation. Um, I actually wish our state leadership would take more leadership like the governors of Ohio and Maryland have done. Um, because even, you know, if different districts making different decisions and change, some are closing for three days, some are closing, coming back Monday, some are, you know, um, I think that this has to be a concerted effort across the state. So I'm hoping that tomorrow um, will be really a turning point for us um, in terms of what we're hearing from the Department of Education and hopefully from the governor. Yes. Um, I first just want to thank both of you for your leadership because this is unprecedented and there are no easy answers and to have to think through all of the scenarios and think of the, the greater good given all of the different issues that arise with every potential solution, it's incredibly challenging. So thank you for thinking through that on our behalf. Um, I, I feel really fortunate to work somewhere that um, articulated that anybody who is even questioning their health should stay home and will not have to use any sick days. Um, and if anybody needs to stay home to take care of somebody else, they will not have to use any sick days. And so I'm wondering if there's been any consideration to allow people, given that this is such a rare occurrence and, and ideally we're not setting a precedent because Hopefully we won't have to ever deal with this again. But um, to say to folks that that between the time of March 15th and June 1st or whatever we're thinking about, that if somebody really needs to, to be home, that they won't need to use sick time, knowing that every single person in this district cares about students and wants to, to support them. And then my second question is about how we might support hourly workers um, with with wages, even if they if the schools close and they're not able to work. There's been thought on both of those, um, and and they, as you have seen from my communications, those are things that are um, important to me. 
The, with respect to sick time, the, the place where I am right now, just, and it, it's what um, Andrea Gito had mentioned in her comments, is that I, I want to liberalize our policies, which is why I said that if someone needed to, had a limited amount of sick time and, and needed to be out of work, not even a self-quarantine, maybe just because, because of their age, because of an underlying condition, a doctor said, I don't want you going to work for now, um, that we would open up the sick bank to them. So that's where I've gotten to that. The next place, certainly the union has, has um, just at the end of the day put forward some proposals around that, which I've thought about but haven't had a chance to really study. So it is on my mind. It's where I've gotten with that. Um, with respect to hourly employees, um, there are some, some things I can share. So uh, one thought that I might have uh, for ESPs is if we do an online instructional format, which seems like it's at least a, a strong possibility that we could involve them in the online instruction and interaction with students so that they could work virtually just as the teachers would be working virtually in that type of scenario. Um, for custodians, I imagine that there would still be sanitation happening of the buildings even if the buildings were not in use. I'm not 100% sure of that because one of the things that was said is this is a virus that we believe lasts four days at most, so maybe the best thing for custodians would be just to lock the door, and when they come back, we'd be coming into a, a sanitary environment. So um, I'm not sure how, how the situation looks for, for custodians. For cafeteria workers, we have sort of the dilemma I just mentioned. If we say, okay, um, we, won't, we won't really care whether or not we receive our federal reimbursement. We'll um, just sort of run a lunch program anyways and give food away. Um, we, could find, we could definitely have the cafeteria workers come in and work normal shifts. They might even be able to work more than they're doing now. Um, but then we have the problem of saying, okay, well, it's all right for you to be exposed, but everyone else we said needs to stay away. So there's that. Um, Another possible solution for custodians is, you know, if the schools are closed, this is, um, this, this is an emergency situation. Their contract says that when they need to report to work, but schools are closed due to an emergency, that they receive a differential. It's actually double time. So, you know, the financial incentive might be a way of helping to make them whole. I'm not sure, but it's, you know, so these are some of the things we could do for hourly employees, um, but, it's a work in progress. Can I just throw out one consideration? That would be that our, you know, there are built-in inequities to the the power differentials in schools already. But I think there's a real inequity in looking at a, a scenario where schools are closed and teachers get paid even if they're not working. And so it might be something to consider that hourly employees also get paid even if they're not working. So I, I think that's a very valid point, but in the discussions that I had, and these are brief discussions, I'm not saying that we reached any final place yet, but we've been discussing having teachers continue to provide some kind of instruction. So, and that was in part because of that. I, you know, it would be very hard to say to, you know, cafeteria workers, okay, we're gonna do the food, will come and you know, you'll get paid, or even custodians, we need to clean the buildings, come in, you'll get paid, and then to say to other employees, you don't have to do any work and you'll get paid. So having online instruction, I think, is more equitable for that reason, and I think it also um, may provide some form of educational benefit. I mean, that's another thing. I mean, we haven't talked much about that. Um, and it actually was in the, the bottom of my list of considerations that are on my mind because it is probably the least cons important right now. But learning still is important. That's, you know, that's hard. You know, I think that in, there was a really good, I'll just say this, another thing that makes me feel bad. I feel that there was really strong instructional momentum going in a number of our schools right now. I feel like, you know, the classes are really 
functioning well, and we're about to just possibly cut that right off. And that's, that's going to take time to recover from. Take really more than a year to recover from if it's a long-term shutdown because you'll be dealing with a much larger than average summer learning loss. So just thoughts. Member Voss. So um, first of all, thank you for making space to have this conversation. One of the reasons I actually asked for this space to have it is I think it's really important for us collectively to just be able to support the work you're doing and also to offer perspectives that might differ slightly because it gives you, I think, some support in, in things that might be different from what our state is doing. So I want to echo what Member um, Levy said in terms of thank you. I know this has been a tough week. I know you haven't been able to answer emails. As I said in an email today to both the mayor and the superintendent, this conversation we're having now to me feels way more important than the budget conversation. And I really thank the people who took time to come speak. We've all gotten emails today. I've gotten a handful. I don't pay attention to who else gets them from parents who are concerned. I've gotten phone calls just from friends, also from people who know I'm on the school committee um, to hear what I'm thinking. I've shared my thoughts with the superintendent and the mayor. And um, I do really appreciate how thoughtful you're being. Um, there's no easy answers, but to weigh in, um, I agree with what's already been said in, in terms of we are in unprecedented crisis here. We need to figure out how to support our staff, all of them, how to pay them if they're hourly, how to keep them safe. And if we have to cancel school for a few weeks and it might turn into more, to me the health of our community is so much more important than a few weeks of learning. And that's a big thing to say. Learning is super important. Um, but kids who may not be getting quite enough food, and it, it, you know, believe me, I want to feed the kids, but if their parents are getting sick because they're bringing germs home, and the parents are not able to take care of the kids, that's even worse in this situation. And just to add to this, we're all watching and following closely, and I really think Northampton needs to be a leader here. Ohio has closed their schools, Maryland has closed their schools, we're a week or two behind Italy, and it's not, if we get a case in our schools and we close them for a couple days and we clean because we know it's here. I have been in touch with medical folks. Um, there's kids in other states in ICUs. Maybe it's not in Northampton quite as tough as it is in other places, but we also know we're not testing in this part of our state. We've hardly tested anyone, so we're not catching it. And I just want to give you that perspective and other people can chime in. I don't, you know, if I'm the only one, I, it carries less weight, but I, I know you're following what our state is telling you to do, what our governor's telling you to do, what Desi's telling you to do, what our health department's telling you to do, and I just want to go on record and say I think a lot of our community, myself included, I've read a lot of science on this this weekend, this week. Um, I would really support you being bold and closing the schools. I'm only smiling because I sneezed and I'm laughing. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, Member Voss. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak? I yeah. just had a quick question. I wasn't exactly sure about the spring sports. Um, did you say that it's a you? There's a delay re, delay response from the school Sorry. district, and is is the MIAA recommending that we delay sports to March? March 30th or is that what is going to happen? To clarify, uh, when we were meeting on Tuesday to discuss issues related to the COVID outbreak, one of the questions was should we just cancel all spring sports now? And what I said at the time was well the, the season isn't scheduled to begin for a week anyways so that's one decision we don't have to make today so let's clear that one off the table. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe something else will happen. And just prior to this meeting, something else did happen. MIAA sent out a uh, memorandum to all districts saying that they're delaying the start of the season until at least, at least March 30th and that there might be an update. They're reserving the right to change to a shutdown status or an extended delay status, um, much as you may have seen in professional sports. Right, right. I just, I just want to say that that's something that I think a lot of the student body is really concerned about and just in general about, I think, surrounding this issue, the students are, you know, 
concerned, worried, really unsure what's going on, um, which I think that's kind of ever how everybody is feeling about it. But um, I think it's, yeah, it's something that the students are feeling too. And yeah, we really appreciate just staying updated and kept in the loop with everything that's going on. So thank you. Mr. Vice Chair? Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, um, just a couple of things. I, I also want to thank you um, for your leadership on this, and it's not the only crisis that we're dealing with. And um, I just can't imagine all the stress and everything that both you and the mayor are going through. So thank you. Um, regarding a specific technical question, is it even legally possible for you to close the schools? At the state of emergency declaration by the governor. Um, provides some flexibility around closure. So the concern has to do with makeup days, right? The rule is that you have to have 180 days of instruction in the state of Massachusetts. Part of the declaration of emergency is that you only have to make up until the end of your planned snow days. So you only have to go to the 185th day that you had on the calendar. So you could cancel 30 and make up five in, in that scenario. So it would be legal. It would be legal for us not to make the 180 days. Yes. Um, uh, Superintendent, you had mentioned about distance learning um, or remote learning. I forget the exact uh, term you used. I'm wondering if you could talk, if you have thought uh, very much about uh, I can imagine what that might look like in a high school or potentially a middle school. What would that look like for an elementary school or kindergarten or preschool? So just to clarify, I, I, I said, I believe I said that we were, are looking at that for grades six through 12. For the elementary grades, our plan is to have the grade level leaders get together on the professional development day that we're scheduling and, and put together materials and games for students to use. So it would, not be, it would not be electronic. It would be more like we're going to put together a, a group of books at this student's just right reading level. We're going to put together some math games for the student to work on. Um, you know, it would be more um, sending home developmentally appropriate materials. Yes, Mr. Um, Cole. I just wanted to share the thanks because certainly in working in a different district and hearing from teachers in other districts, we're, we're certainly, your, your leadership is certainly unique in the amount of communication, the frequency, and so I greatly, greatly appreciate it as a parent and, and as an educator, so thank you. Thank you. Deborah Bysansky. Um, also just, you know, ditto the, the thank you because I know it's been just an incredibly um, stressful week and a really an unprecedented time and I just, um, I, I also want to encourage you to look past what the governor is saying and what Jesse is, is coming out with and think about, um, you know, we have these other models that have worked at least, you know, uh, flatten the curve, if not get rid of it. And one way is to get out in front of this and really think about closing our schools before we actually identify that first case in our schools. That almost feels kind of, you know, late. So. I just want to encourage you to um, think about that. And I agree, we should be getting this from the governor. We should be getting this from the commissioner at DESE, and we're not getting that kind of leadership. But I don't think that should um, keep us from doing what we feel like we need to do to keep our community safe. Yes. Apologies for the second uh, question. And of also reiterate, um, thanks. Um, and I hope you are able to get some sleep at some point. Um, one question that I have had, as you may know, uh, my partner is a professor in epidemiology, so we've been talking about what what this means, what would actually help uh, flatten the curve in the community. And one, um, one concern is uh, that, at least kind of in the uh, brainstorming phase, has been around, well, if you close schools and parents are still needing to go to work, those kids will need caregivers, and those caregivers are likely to be, in some cases, grandparents. And grandparents are the folks who are, are of the age that are more susceptible. So uh, I, I'm, uh, 
I guess I'm, I'm sure that's something that you've thought about, but I'm raising that again here. And, uh, and also then thinking about my own child and the struggles that we have been going through around, um, around hand washing, around taking this seriously. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about what sort of instruction is happening now with kids about understanding in, without panic, without scaring them, but understanding the importance of, of hand washing and not getting up into grandma and grandpa's faces or you know, just some of those things around what this all means. Mm -hmm. So we have given teachers some brief scripts to use with students to explain, explain to them the importance of hand washing. In the elementary schools, we've asked nurses to go in and talk to classes about hand washing. We've increased the number of hand washing stations within the schools and asked schools to change their protocol to you know, basically force kids to wash their hands whether or not they want to. Um, I, I will say that, you know, it's developmentally more easy to do that with younger children than it is with older children. Um, so, you know, with students at the high school, it is more around, you know, making it sort of a corny game they can, they can put up with. Like yesterday I saw a video from the cafeteria where they had a teacher sort of like a drill instructor yelling at each kid, wash, 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 <laughs> as they were walking by the hand wash station. Um, so it's, it's a struggle, um, but it is certainly a, a real educational effort that we're undertaking. Um, I think that with young children, it's hard for them sort of to conceptualize what we're talking about. After all, a, a virus is invisible, um, and not an understanding the means of transmission is hard, but you know, we are using all the materials that they're putting out to try to um, help students understand that in a developmental way. At the high school, uh, we deal with the, the sort of developmental perspective that students feel they're invincible. And so helping to break down that, or at least sort of puncture that a little bit is the, the focus at the high school. Um, but it's, it's hard and we really need families to help us. You know, this has to be, no pun intended, all hands on deck around hand washing and hygiene because that is the thing. I mean, that's the weapon we have, right? There's no, there's no medicine, there's no um, inoculation for it. All we have is, all we have is hygiene, really. Oh, I'm sorry. No, it's okay. You're Far much away. farther away. <laughs> yeah, um, I just want to say that at the high school level, it does seem like something that they're trying to implement more into like the curriculum. I know two out of the three classes that I have at the high school, we showed videos of like how to wash your hands properly. Please wash your hands. In my French class, we watched like a video in French about you know <laughs> washing your hands and, and making sure to do that. So um, I think it's been kind of seen as like a funny thing, but it's also something that's being kind of continuously implemented in classes and not just, you know, oh, you should do this. Like, yeah. So that's just to add on. Member Moss. Um, a question and then a comment. Are you, do you feel like high school students are washing their hands more this week than they had previously? Is it working? I think, I do think that it seems like the that kind of idea of why, I, I don't know if students are actually washing their hands, but I've heard, you know, multiple students are more concerned about the issue and have said, you know, they're washing their hands, they understand how to do it, and uh, I know I've seen more, many more students using hand sanitizer after they blow their nose, after they cough, you know, doing all of those things, um, and, you know, hand sanitizer and, you know, yeah, hand washing materials are more prevalent in classrooms and stuff like that, so I think overall students are more it does seem like students are more aware of it, um, at least from what I've seen in the students that I've been around. Well, just to thank you. Yeah. And I guess what I just wanted to add is what's led me to feel pretty strongly that our district needs to seriously consider closing soon and is, is the contagiousness of this appears to be about 10 to 20 times that of the flu, not as bad as the measles but I think
think any students are going to have trouble. I have trouble not much touching my face, and I know right, that. Right. It's really hard. And from the interactions I've had with high school students, that's who I tend to hang out with these days, um, I think it's almost too much to even ask of them to not spread it. And social distancing, when you have 800 kids passing in hallways at once, mm -hmm. is just like our teachers are saying, it isn't able to happen. And so that's why I really worry as best intentioned as we can be. I don't see how we're not going to share this virus. Mm -hmm. And this virus takes 14, 0 to 14 days, about 5 to 7 on average. And once it hits, um, it's too late. Right. So, mm -hmm. you know, as much as we're doing these measures, I don't know that we really can do them. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm worried about that. And I really support um, reacting strongly. And just to kind of echo that, I know, like, with these measures of washing our hands, using hand sanitizer, trying to be more careful after, you know, blowing your nose or coughing or sneezing, um, it still is, like, you know, a lot of classrooms are smaller and have 30, 35 kids crammed in there or in the stairwells when everybody's in between class. It's, you know, packed one, you know, one every like every step has a kid on it going in both directions and um and so there i think that close proximity is something to to worry about because it is prevalent and i don't i'm not sure you know if there's a way to kind of get around that um even if students are being more cautious about you know taking those measures to to make sure that they're sanitary themselves okay are there any other questions or comments? Well, thank you all for, for the um, good feedback and questions. And um, uh, I know the superintendent will be keeping the school community informed, and I'll be doing my best to keep the city informed as to what we're, uh, where we're, what we're doing next on this. So the next item on the agenda is announcements. Are there announcements from members of the school committee? OK. Seeing none, um, we have um, we have items on the um, consent agenda. Though, do we have? Okay, so um, with the, we do not have the minutes, um, but we do have um, some June field trip requests, which I think we're also going to uh, skip. So we don't have a consent agenda actually. <laughs> So uh, we'll move right to the student representative uh, portion of the meeting. Can I also say, how did we kids that were going to be here, their parents decided to keep them home tonight. So they will hopefully come to a future school committee to demonstrate their robotics. Makes sense. OK. Um, so I'll turn to you, Eleanor, as our student representative to give your report. Yeah. So um, I think I was going to talk a little bit about the coronavirus and what students are thinking but I think we covered that so um, I did want to talk about the I I know that you all received a letter from students um, on in regards to uh, the death of Maria and the school's actions um, after that and um, I just wanted to let you all know that the student union um, has read the letter and we are aware that it has been sent to um, you all and to Ms. Valancourt and Dr. Provost. And um, however, it is not a student union affiliated letter. Um, and I, I just want to make that clear, but we are aware of it and we did read it and we understand the contents. Um, yeah. I don't, I'm not sure if I should answer questions about it just because it isn't affiliated with the student union. Um, but I, yeah, I think that's kind of what I should say about that. Um, moving on, I, we in the past couple of meetings with the student union, um, we've discussed creating a video and a pamphlet um, to inform students about um, the people that are in the school that they can go to uh, if they are if they feel the need to get help for uh, vaping. Um, and I know that we've talked about this uh, at the last meeting and maybe the meeting before, how we've been uh, you know, talking with people in the school, um, the nurse, the school adjustment counselor, to see if they are mandated reporters if a student comes to them, um, wanting to 
uh, stop vaping or feeling that they have an addiction, um, stuff like that. And so we were able to confirm, I think, we, as I said at the last meeting, that um, both the nurse and the school adjustment counselor are not mandated reporters for that those instances. And so they are really great resources for students to use to go to if they want help. Um, and so we've been kind of trying to figure out ways to spread that information and we've decided on making a pamphlet and um, a video that will share that and hopefully be able to spread um, throughout the school community. Uh, we haven't talked yet with the administration, but we do have a meeting with Ms. Valancourt at the end of the month planned and so um, we're still in kind of the be beginning stages of this process of making the video and the pamphlet, but uh, when we meet with her, hopefully we'll have some more information and, and be able to talk to her about it then. Um, we also want to include in this video and in the pamphlet um, information about students' rights when they are talking to a school administrator or um, the school resource officer. If, you know, if an administrator or the school resource officer is, you know, ask them questions, calls them down to their office surrounding vaping and possibly, you know, other substance use, um, you know, what kind of, what their rights are in those situations, you know, if they have to answer questions, um, you, you know, do they have the right to bring a parent or something like that into the room? Um, and, and so we're still trying to find, figure out what those um, rights are, but we have talked with the women um, about it, and um, so that's something else that we'd want to include in the um, in the video because we think it's important for students to know, you know, what exactly is expected of them in those types of situations. Um, I also emailed with Ananda Lennox to talk about um, putting this video pamphlet out because there's also the um, the uh, social media campaign that with the MPC that is working be, like in the works um, and I wanted to make sure that this didn't interfere with it or anything like that and she was really on board and supportive so um, uh, and I think because this is you know information that's helpful for, for um, students who are vaping but it's not directly targeted at like stopping it or anything like that I think it'll be kind of a good uh, kind of pair to this this um, new social media campaign. Um, we have also decided to um, do another round of grants applications, um, and so their applications for grants from the student union um, are going to be due from clubs or organizations or students by April 17th, um, the Friday before break and April break. Um, I'm not sure if that's going to change given this new virus issue, but um, I guess we'll see how that goes when, when we figure out what's happening. <laughs> um, so uh, that's exciting and we're hoping that that will, you know, be as more successful than it has been. Um, we also, a few members of the student union, went to a real meeting with the JFK Soka um, Club a couple of weeks ago, and we uh, wanted to go to one of the real meetings to just kind of see what they're doing and um, get more of a connection, and it was, um, you know, good to be at JFK and to get that connection with students there um, and see you know, how the SOCA there is working with REAL um, because I'm, I don't think that REAL and the SOCA NHS has as much of a connection as um, the JFK SOCA does. And so it was good to see what that was looking like. And we, the students were doing an activity where they were kind of um, assigning themes to different stories that had been shared via the REAL website. Um, and being able to share their own stories and, and talking about them with their peers. Um, and so we helped them with that and for our own stories and it was good to be there, I think. Um, but we are hoping to have um, more communication with Real and meet again with Jenny Bender from Real um, to, to 
yeah, get, I think, more of a connection with NHS and that uh, organization. So that's kind of what we've been doing for the past month. Um, and it all seems like it's going in a pretty good direction. Um, I also did want to mention that we had a meeting with Dr. Provost, Ms. Valancourt, Ms. Sheridan, and Ms. Malbezzi uh, yesterday. Yeah, yeah, it's been a long week. Um, <laughs> yesterday to discuss an email that Ms. Valancourt had sent us and some concerns that she had around um, communication with the, um, both the student union and the uh, senior class advisors, or not, sorry, not advisors, officers. Um, and so we were able to talk with her and them about that. Um, and we also discussed the student letter um, with some of the members, uh, some of the people who were involved in writing the letter. Um, and so I think that was a good meeting. And Ms. Valancourt, I think we're going to work on getting more of a connection with her. Um, and, and yeah, that's what we've been working on. Thank you very much for that report. Thank you. Um, so uh, as we heard earlier, um, we will not have the um, our guests from Project Lead the Way tonight. Um, we do have a report on the census, 2020 census. Oh, excellent. OK. I couldn't see you from behind the podium. Um, if you would just introduce yourself and your role. Sure. Uh, my name is Oraya Baus, and I'm a partnership specialist with the US Census Bureau. <clears throat> and today, I'm here to talk about something that is already happening too, and is the census count. So the federal census started today. So if you check, we are expecting to receive a mail in, the, in our room, in our households, and please answer. And <clears throat> where the schools get into it? So the census created is statistics, is statistics in school and we call CIS for short. And it's classroom material, so you can use that for sending home for the kids. <laughs> there are pre-K materials to uh, 12th grade, and um, they were prepared for teachers, you know, uh, for teachers. And they have the student part and the teacher part, and you can, the, the activities are already ready to go. You can just download and use in the classroom. And why you would do that? It's because all the census does is count the population, and that's the baseline data for the money distribution, right? So <clears throat> special ed, free and reduced lunch, <clears throat> class size reduction, classroom technology, teacher training, all affected by federal funding. So if we miscount or if we, we miss someone, that person, it's about $2,000 or more per year, per 10 years. So, and we did miss in 2010, we missed a lot of young children. So those young children, they are now in sixth grade. So we really need to emphasize to count them as the parents. So if you use the material in your classroom, and if you, you know, advocate to use that, the kids will talk to the parents. And they will say, oh, we need to answer that. We need to you know, pay attention to it. It's important for our community. Because federal money, federal tax money, that's one way that the money comes back, right? And that's what I have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do you have a question? Uh, yes, sorry, I had a question. Um, I know there's been a lot of uh, confusion and concern about absolutely getting a complete count and concerns about whether or not we uh, would be able to, or whether people would be nervous to answer the census based on questions that are on the census. So I just wanted to know, uh, or have, uh, have it publicly stated, will there be a question on the census re regarding immigration status? No, it doesn't. We don't ask for citizenship status, or nor uh, social security, bank account, uh, nothing like that. Okay, thank you so much. No problem. Any other? And we are working on the fear part. And I myself am an immigrant. And I speak Spanish and Portuguese. And I've done many meetings. And it is a reality. But we, we count on, you know, trust. Trust 
you know, community members. To tell people is protected by the Constitution. So you are protected, your data is protected, you are, you are a number. When you get in the internet, because this, this is one way that you're gonna answer the census this year for the first time, internet option, your data is encrypted. You are a number. You are not personal by identifying anyway. So <clears throat> it is safe, easy, and it just should help your community. Thank you so much for coming tonight. We appreciate it. You're Thank you. Oh, did you have a? Oh, I'm sorry. I, have, I guess I have. Oh, a it looked question. like you had a question. I for, yeah. Um, Thank you, okay. and it, I really appreciate that we need to count all our children to help with funding that where there's never enough. And I guess the question I have is, is it, I don't know, is it appropriate to try to get help through PTOs or other things to hand these things out? And so who are we doing we, that already? I would, yeah, I, I have, we have a citywide complete count committee that, um, that the superintendent has a representative on, and I know she's here. She's here, actually, yeah, you're right. Hey, there you are, Pam, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, so go ahead, um, I'm sorry. Yeah, so all of that, and I would also say that we received a, a folder full of materials from the census uh, around communications to families that we've asked principles to include in their e-communications to families over the course of the next two weeks. So we hope that that matches up well with your timeline. Um, they come at different levels, so we asked principals to choose the communications that were most appropriate for their grade level. Um, so um, there are probably, I want to say 20 different um, sample communications to include in those. And so we asked principals to choose at least two and to send them out over the course of the next two weeks. And uh, one thing that I asked every school, and I can ask here and you can ask you to your system, <clears throat> it's they have a, the, the phone call that the school has, the system, right, to call the parents. Mm -hmm. So on April 1st, if you can, you know, remind parents, census day, please answer your census, you know, use one of the messages from the, from, you know, the templates. That would be really helpful, you know, reminding parents that they need to answer the census and account for everyone in the household. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so the next item on the agenda is the presentation and discussion of the FY 2021 budget book. Which you have in front of you. Um, at your table tonight is the budget book that's been prepared um, with all the data that we try to um, compile for you to answer our questions on the story of the district that we have in place and what we're proposing to do for next year. Um, we've also emailed it to you electronically, so if you want to give the back books back to me when you're done, I'll gladly take them back and recycle them to others that would like the books instead. Um, and also, it's on our website as well. It's put up this afternoon. So those are the places that it's available if anybody chooses to see it. Um, I've been working with Dr. Provost and the mayor going to a number of meetings about coronavirus as well this week. Um, I know that's the most pressing item. Um, <coughs> it, it is definitely more important than the budget, and I do understand that. I'm not just the numbers person that cares about nothing else but my numbers and my book. <laughs> um, but it's also a business process that we need to keep moving forward because we do have guidelines to keep going. Um, my plan originally for tonight was to actually spend a little bit more time going through it and explaining some of it in a little bit more detail than I did last year, knowing that we've got a number of new members and I wanna have, make sure you have a good understanding of things and have an opportunity to ask questions. Um, but I also don't wanna spend too much time on it giving other things that are going on right now. So um, if you don't mind, I'll start through, and if you want me to speed up or slow down, please let me know, okay? Um, so the beginning of the book, we've got the, the table of contents of everything that's in the um, book that all the information. Um, the superintendent's budget message is in the beginning of the book in section one. Um, I would encourage all the members and the public to take the time to read all the messages in the book because I think you'll learn a great deal um, of information from those um, messages that are in there from both the principals, the administrators, the superintendent. I think it gives you a good indication of things that are going on in our school district. Uh, we have a list of all the school committee members and our student representative. 
somebody if they know who's currently there. Um, for our budget overview, we've got the fiscal 21 budget is being proposed at 32 million seven hundred twenty three thousand four hundred and sixty four thousand dollars four hundred sixty four dollars um, that's an increase of one point six million dollars or a five point one six five point four one four one percent increase okay. um, the next page we have the proposed 21 budget by the cost center so each one of our schools is considered a cost center um, as, along with the athletic department special education department uh, central services and then district wide district wide would be anybody who services all of the schools at the same time um, one of the columns that i wanted to point out to you so we give you some information about the fiscal 18 what we actually spent um, that would be from the budget only the 19 what we actually spent but the budget only fiscal 20 that's our school committee approved budget that's going on right now our fiscal 21 school committee proposed budget figure that we're looking at for next year by cost center and the la over next column is fiscal 21 other funding that would be any source of funds that come from grants or revolving accounts and we'll get a little bit further into that um, I'll explain some of that is mostly federal and state grants um, the special education cost in this is directly related to schools identified in special ed but in this report here on this page special ed has been pulled out and is self-contained in itself so the schools do not represent special ed costs in those schools as well on that page and I've tried to indicate where special ed is included in the schools and where it is not so you can separate those um, some people yep I'm so sorry could you I just spaced out and lost track of what you said about special ed could you just sure what you just said? sure so um, when I'm displaying some of the information by cost center I indicate special education is its own so in other words if you have a special education service that's the staffing special ed costs are related to a particular school this report here on this page is, is pulling it out and it's in special ed only there's other reports that will say it the cost center includes the special ed cost for that particular school so each page will show whether it's included in the school or not okay um, some people like it visually better to be able to see what portion what percentage what of the budgets going to one so this is the um, total spending together so it's the local budget and the other funding that's being spent at each one of the cost centers and some people like it visually that way so um, special ed is running about 30 percent of our entire budget right now in total um, and some of the other um, cost the high school is at 13 and a half the district is at 14.2 um, so those are the, the largest spending of the district right now on the next page the fiscal 21 budget by cost center with the special education included in the school site budget so that way you can see the comparison between the two And they're the same numbers on this sheet it also gives you the number of students way up over to the right column for each one of the schools and this would be as of October 1 because that's when the state counts everything for enrollment is as of October 1 so on the next page and I'm, trust me I'm not going to go page by page every single one of them I promise um, the next um, page has the fiscal 21 it's a total budget by the Department of Ed so the Department of Ed requires that we report every dollar we spend by certain categories and as crazy as it may look every account number has a purpose and a reason and this is what how it gets to this so when we report at the end of the year in September how we spent our money to come up with certain things this is how they're all categorized so they have 1000s our administration 2000s our instruction 3000s our student services which are um, transportation food service athletics medical services um, 4000s are operation maintenance 5000s employee benefits and fixed costs and 9000s are tuitions 7000s would also be capital expenditures however they're not in our budget we'll talk about that in a moment so as you can see almost 75 percent of our operating budget only is spent on direct instructional costs okay. um, 
again, you can see from the chart that's on here, this does include all the projected funding sources, so it's our budget and our grants and revolving. And over 78% of all the funding sources um, to operate the school department goes to the personnel costs. Yep. In, in, in instruction, mm -hmm. on that previous one, mm -hmm. um, the purplish uh, the color, yep. um, is that, what, like what's, tied into instruction exactly? Is it just teachers? Like is it curriculum expenditures? Is it? Curriculum, it would be anything, um, so it would be the principals, the curriculum, uh, the teachers, the ESPs, um, guidance, um, adjustment counselors. I'm going down all my list of account numbers as you can tell in my head. <laughs> um, uh, instruction, any materials that we're purchasing, okay. as well as the personnel costs. Um, the next page is a summary of all the funds, which I think this is a real important page for all of you, um, because I think it gives you a good breakdown of all the sources of funding that we have to run the school department budget. Um, when I say the budget, I'm talking about the entire operation, so it's our operating budget that's given to us by the city, in addition to the grants, in addition to the revolving accounts, um, and what areas are spending what kind of money. Um, so we have our local appropriations, which is money that the city provides to us in our budget. We have school choice revenue, which is a revolving account. A circuit breaker, which is a revolving account. The food service, which is a revolving account. Athletic revolving, a bus revolving, and a grants and other revolving. So I'll, I'll quickly go through what a revolving account was if you want to at the moment. Um, so a revolving account is something that is by legislation that we are allowed to keep in separate funds for a particular intended use. It's restricted on what we can spend. So for instance, um, food service, we can charge only expenditures related to the food service operation. We can't charge our busing charges there. Um, it is usually the money comes in from a certain designated fee or a revenue source. So school choice is the number of students we take in, the states give us that money. Circuit breaker is special education costs over a certain dollar amount for any high cost special education students. We are reimbursed from the state a certain percentage each year. The following year we receive those money. Food service is the money we get for federal reimbursement and the money that we take at the cash register from students. Athletic revolving is both the fees that we collect from sports fees as well as the um, generous donations that we get from Cooley Dickinson Hospital and from the um, Booster Club to help support the program. So those are funding sources. Uh, the bus revolving is the bus fees that we collect um, from the students to ride the buses. And the grants um, are both federal and state grants that they're either entitlement grants or the competitive grants that we apply for to see if we can get. The other revolving are things like the preschool tuition account helps fund some of our um, salary expenses for the preschool program and some supplies. Um, so those, and we do actually have a, a special education tuition also if we have students that are here that we can collect money from other districts, we do that as well. Um, so those are the, the main sources, so that's a good page of seeing the whole snapshot. The only piece that is not on there um, that I'd like to highlight is, because it's not, um, represented as dollars that we spend through our business office is actually the city funds that actually do that. So in other words, there are operations on the city side that are not in our operating budget in any way. It's services that the city provides to the school department for things that run, the health insurance, to pay the bills, the payroll, the human resource office. Those are all on the city side that we say they go on our end of year report as an offset charge. They're not in our budget. We don't pay them, but we take the expense at the end of the year and say that would be a cost that we would otherwise have to pay for, but the city pays for. So that's the only number that's not here. And I did write it down and I can take a look at the end. One of the sections that actually is in there. It's quite a large number. Um, two questions. Mm -hmm. One. So thank you, mm -hmm. thank you for that. The 39.398 million at the bottom of this page that you just showed mm -hmm. us, 
is the reason that number doesn't match what's labeled at the very beginning, fiscal year 21 budget of 32.7 million because of those reasons you just said. And related to that, could you also tell us about what I think the city pays certain, I don't know if benefits is the right word, but mm -hmm. certain parts of salaries that doesn't show up in this 32.7? Mm -hmm. So if you take a look at that summary of all funds page, the very first column is the 32 million, which is a local appropriation. Thank you. Okay. So that will match that. That's what the city appropriates as part of the budget okay. process. All the other funds are separate funds that it takes to run the school department operation the way it is now today. That do not come from the city budget appropriation. It takes us $39 million plus to run the operation for the school department. So is that difference then on I don't know how to describe what page it is, but after this first main page, there's that column that says FY21 other funding. Correct. That's that six point six seven five million dollars. That's Correct. the other part yep. that adds up, mm -hmm. and that's the part that the city is. That's not. That's. That's not what the city is. No, no there's right. a whole other. Yeah, that's a whole other. Right, exactly. So that. Correct. So it's thirty nine million plus what's exactly. the city. Right. So it's Correct, and, and I'm digging through my pages because yeah. I have that page in here. So this page, the thirty nine. That plus the 32 plus the that. Okay. Plus the that. Can I, can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, it might not relate. If it's for another time, let me know. But we're not. If we're not um, calculating into our budget with the city spends, which is upwards of a like almost 15 million, like like, it, like whatever mm -hmm. that is, and based on the 55 percent that we saw that we actually spent for us. When you look at DESE's uh, accountability for us and what we spend per student, mm -hmm. is the state publicizing based on the 39? It, like, is it making it look like we spend less on our schools per student than No, so what, when I file the end of year report, I have to file for the $32 million plus the other $6 million plus what the city tells us, cool. so a total of all three, I want to say, sources uh, of yeah. funds, okay. total spending to operate the entire place. And for fiscal 20, um, and I'll get, when we get down to section 15, um, for this current year, the city is $8.2 million is what they're contributing towards school services. That would include health insurance costs and other services provided, um, retirement um, insurance for buildings, those kind of expenses, as well as the services. But for okay. purposes of count, you know, for calculating net school spending, mm -hmm. there's only certain categories of school funding that they factor into that. Correct. But I'm probably getting way into the weeds. But just like when, yeah. yeah. So okay. the net school p spending piece comes from is just the chapter 70, yeah. and what the city has to provide yes. from the city appropriation towards it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But doesn't our per pupil spending also factor in, uh, in addition to sort of health insurance, those big numbers, we also did work out what we get from the city in terms of space, sort of rent that we would have paid if for space we're using. I just remember in budget. Not rent, property. but. Yeah, there's no, no, yeah, there's well, no we're space. not actually paying rent, but sort of space usages and other things. Doesn't that get factored in? I think you're talking about people? the indirect costs. Yeah. yeah. So I think some indirect costs count and some don't. But Kim, can answer yeah. that better than so, me. So the capital, for instance, when the city on their capital project puts on a roof or pays a parking mm -hmm. lot, that's not counted towards net school spending at all. But it's Got work it. that's been done that the city's funded at the right. schools. Got it. So there's, there's a number that the transportation. There's a couple of pieces that don't count yeah, towards it's net school spending. Projects over a certain dollar threshold don't count toward net school spending because they feel like that's it's a one time like you're only going to replace a roof every 20 years so you shouldn't really count that towards the ongoing spending mm -hmm. not that it's not real money but it just doesn't count in the net school spending yeah everybody good to keep going uh, so the, the next page I have the fiscal 21 budget staffing changes uh, one thing that we've always done in the past is that, um, highlight and clarify so the budget book was put together last March. So between last March and this March of this current budget, how many changes have been made? So the top portion of this where it says fiscal 20 after the budget approved, 
Those are the number of personnel changes that have happened since last March when the budget was book was put together up until now of this current school year. Fiscal 21 new is the proposed changes for next year. And I know most of these, actually all of these have gone through as part of um, Dr. Provost's first view budget presentation that we had gone through. So that's just itemized all on one page. Um, and the recommendations from alt team was putting these, this list forward. On the next page, uh, we've had a list of ESP FTEs, which is the full-time equivalents for next school year. And that is summarized on the bottom right-hand corner of the summary of changes, uh, which is there would be an increase of a special education ESP for Ryan Road. There would be four grade one ESPs increase, which would be one at each elementary school, and a decrease of a half library uh, ESP at JFK is what's being proposed. Okay. Right. Just to yep. clarify, so the, the page behind the yep. changes, yep. Yeah, so the FY 20, these are, and if you said this, I just want to make sure I'm hearing you right. Mm -hmm. These are the additions that have already gone through, and the FY 21 are the proposed changes that haven't yet been approved. Correct. Which would be for next school year. Are all these the same information we received last on the first week? No changes there. Okay. Um, in the second section is a copy of the budget that Dr. Provost gave when we met um, February 27th. So you have it for reference if you like. I don't need it. Go to one of those pages. Um, so each one of the tabs from three to eight are each one of the schools by themselves. Each principal or program director has written uh, profiles, what we call them, a budget narrative, explaining what's going on in their schools. Um, I, I would encourage you to please take the time. You'll learn an awful lot from those school, each particular school, what's going on, some concerns that they have, why they're addressing certain things. Um, I think it's good information for you. Um, each one of the sections also has a fiscal 21 budget staff FTE sheet. So this is the number of positions and the FTEs for each position we have. And I've separated out the school and then the special education staffing within that school on the same page. So that way you can see both. If you take a look, we've got fiscal 20, what was budgeted, what we are currently funding, and what's funded out of the budget, and what's funded out of other funds. At the bottom of the fiscal 20 center column that says current, anything that has changed from the original budget has been highlighted and summarized at the bottom. Anything that's being proposed for 21 of a change is off in the right hand column under the fiscal 21 notes. So you can quickly go down for that school in which position is included in that number. Okay. And each school has one of these sheets for their particular school. The fiscal 21 budget sheet for each one of the schools, the left-hand side will tell you which school it is, so it's Bridge Street. These are all the account numbers that we have to account for for the Department of Education, so that's why it looks like that. I'm sorry. <laughs> can, can I ask you, so I'm on the Bridge Street budget. The budget page. The one you're looking at, I think. The FTEs or the budget? The, sorry, the FTEs. Okay. And I'm just asking as an example, not I'm not picking on this for any reason other than making sure I'm following it. Mm -hmm. If you go down to where it says ESPs, regular ed, fiscal year 26, fiscal year 20, it goes 666. Six, six. Are you with me? Yes. In that right column there? Yep. And then it says new position 1.0 grade 1. How do we see that new position, that new ESP that's being proposed in that 666? Are we? Because it should say seven. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sorry. No, that's fine. Sorry. I, 
No, I was counting. I wasn't. I was just making sure I was following. No. <laughs> You're correct. Really? And when I counted them a hundred times on each page, after I divide them eight different ways, <laughs> um, I, I will have to go back and see because going in between the preschool, the special ed, the regular ed, and the library piece is probably where I lost one person going one way or the other on the count on the sheet. So I'll have to let you know which number I need to correct because one of those should change. And I have to double check that. I may have only put what we currently have and didn't add it on that one. Okay. So that I need to double check and I can find out. Okay. Sorry about that. But otherwise, yes, your understanding's correct. Thank you. Uh, so the fiscal 21 budget, um, each one of the schools had their page. You can see what we have spent, actually spent in fiscal 18 what we actually spent in fiscal 19, and keep in mind, this is only the local appropriation budget. This is not all spending in those columns. Um, in the midst of all this, the last two years, Department of Ed has decided to change some of the account numbers on us, so I'm trying to reference, and we've referenced last year and this year, when an account number was something else. So when you can see two years ago, we had no money spent in that number, and now all of a sudden we're spending, that's why, because they changed the account number on us. Um, we have the fiscal 20 approved budget and the fiscal 21 local budget um, being recommended, including any increases that we're expecting to have in those salaries for next year. This um, beginning part of this is going to be just the regular education costs of that school. And then we have a separate page for the special education costs of that school. So there should be two pages, for instance, for Bridge Street, and then the third page would be the special education costs and the staffing for that, for that school. And I wanted to show, for instance, um, there's an ESP at the preschool, probably about the fourth line from the bottom. And over to the right, you'll see there's a $15,000 loss of an inclu inclusive preschool grant. So we have received notice from the state that next year that grant we will no longer have that funding so those things were built into the budget um, that we had to put in there so those are some of those indications we've had along the way um, and that's what it had paid for previously because it was in the other column before so each one of the schools Can you just re what is that uh, I forgot what you said SC approach change appropriation what is that column again? That's the, yeah. It's just our local budget from the city. It's not all the grants and all the revolvings. It's just our local appropriation. And that's and a change. The change. Oh. I'm sorry, yeah, the change one, I'm sorry. Or is this SC approach change on the FY21 budget pages? That, that last column? The school committee appropriation change. So that would be the difference in the dollars from fiscal 20's budget to fiscal 21's budget. So, they, so like for salaries, that's the increase Correct. of the salary. And then, so then can I ask, and that is the change based on contracts. the, the current the the, contract that was signed? The contract that's that signed, was, uh, current staff that's in the position, yeah. assuming that everyone stays still, that's what it would look like next year. Now I take a snapshot right, okay. at the beginning of January and make all the calculations, okay. and that's the numbers that go in there. So anybody that's changing around, moving target every day. Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. This might be way too specific, so tell me that and I can't hold it for another mm -hmm. time. I'm looking at the Leeds FY21 budget and I'm looking at the classroom teacher's regular ed, which is sort of in the middle of the page. You're talking about the dollars? I believe I'm talking about the dollars. Okay. Uh, it says on the very far right, FY 2021 notes, 1.0 FTE new position. Correct. And directly to the left of that, it says 113,814. The, the change in dollars. Right. So is that, am I to understand then that in order to get one new FTE at Leeds, it's going to cost $113,814? No. So what's going to happen is, so your fiscal 20 column has $990,000. That's what it's costing right now for all the staff that are currently there. 
the next column is your $1.1 million for next year. That's what it will cost to pay all your people that are currently there at next year's salary plus, plus the new person. Okay. Okay? Thanks. All right. Um, so each one of the schools, I won't go through each one of them because they're all similar format. Um, tab 9. Yep. Okay. A quick question on these individual budgets. Some of the lines have some shading and some don't. Is there anything significant about that? Um, the only thing should, should probably have the shading would be where I put in the account numbers or there was no money um, because the account number had changed. So I was just trying to highlight because okay. I was trying to keep track of them. So okay. I think I just wondering if that meant anything to me. So tab 9. Um, athletic department again our athletic director has written a um, detailed information about the program participants for the students um, part of the athletic um, operation is paid for by the city appropriation part of the school department budget in addition to the revolving account that they get from fees gate receipts um, which are people coming in and paying, as well as the donations that I mentioned earlier. So that's one of those multiple funding source operations that are going on. So it's not just the budget and it's not just the fees that are supporting the athletic department. Um, the athletic department, because it is a revolving account in a little bit separate, um, they do some more involved information for you. So you can see on the next page the budget of what the revenues are coming in and the funding sources how much money is spent from each one of the sources on each type of the expense. The next page we have a cost for each one of the sports and a revenue for each sport so you know how much each sport costs and how much it brings in. Um, we have the number of participants for each one of the sports and what the fees that are generated. And we have um, another sheet that has, by sport, all the individual kinds of expenditures and the dollar amounts for each one of those expenditures by sport. We have a list of all the coaching stipends that are in part of the unit A contract um, that are in there and that they're designated dollar amounts depending on the years of service that the person has provided. That number changes slightly. Um, the athletic revolving fund, we have a historical revenue and expenditure, so that way you can see the balance that it's been running, how much has been gone in there each year, how much has been spent out of there each year, um, and where we've landed as of June 30th, 2019. Next page, we have the athletic user fees, so you know right now what they're paying for fees. We got a couple questions. So I'm still on where you had the sport, the estimated cost, the estimated revenue, and the net cost. Mm -hmm. Is the revenue including what parents are paying for their kids to participate in the sport? Is that where the revenue is coming from? From user fees, yes. User fees, yes. 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 Okay. And um, are there other revenues or is that it? Um, on the page that yeah. listed estimated revenue, the other kind of revenue would be the gate receipts. Okay. So when okay. people are coming and attending events. Thank you. Okay. Um, my question was on the uh, revolving fund. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if you can just speak to why the revolving fund balance has been going up. Um, depending on the participation in the sports, in the fees, I believe they were adjusted in fiscal 18, we adjusted them upward a bit to try to support some more of the program. And then we also had a larger number of students participating in the sports. Yeah. Um, so that's increased some of it. Well, it, uh, I mean, is it like, um, is it seen as a reserve fund? It's, it's definitely an offset because depending on the budgets, and how they go and the cost of the programs to run. So if there's a large increase, um, is the budget going to pay for it or is the revolving fund going to pay for it? Is what the determination gets made. And if the budget has a difficult time, it may come that we ask the revolving fund to pay for more of the operation. So is, is the idea then to 
try and grow that fund or is the idea to try and spend the revenue that we have? I, I don't say it's a matter of growing it, but at least trying to maintain a balance sufficient to pay for certain operations for a period of time, just like the school lunch program and a number of other funds. They need to have a sustainability piece of it as well. Member Boss. Um, I know there's some st deeper stuff here. I just don't remember what it is. The Cooley Dickinson donation. Correct. I don't. Can you can you describe it? Sure. Um, they necessarily don't give us a donation, per se. They don't give us a check. Um, they provide an athletic trainer to us, which would be a cost of about $35,000. So they provide that service for us. And so I just, I think that's important as we look at some of the numbers. Just know that's very generous and lovely, but it's not cash that we can move around in different ways. Correct. It's but if we didn't, if we didn't have that donation, we would have to pay it because we're required for certain sports to have an athletic trainer available. And just part B of that same question is, is that why the cost of football is so much? Because they get a bigger percentage of that or? Um, that one I may have to defer to either get some more information from the athletic director. I know there are certain sports that require the athletic trainer more, than, but I, I, to be honest, I couldn't tell you. Which I don't need the exact details. Yeah. I just thought it was helpful because yeah. that really stands out. Some sports stand out as being much more expensive, and I, it might be good to know that it's not, that that's why. All right. Everybody doing good? You want me to move a little bit faster or slower? You're good with the pace. Tell me. OK. Uh, so we have the user fees, so you can see what they're currently paying right now. Um, tab 10 is our special education student service department um, programs. Um, so this is the entire district. Um, Pam Plummer is actually our, our special education uh, director. She's been in the district for about 10 years and has a great district-wide perspective. Um, so she's provided a lot, a lot of information. So again, I would encourage you to read that. I think you'll learn a great deal. I think it's very beneficial um, to gain her history of that. Um, with the budget sheets that are here, I've represented it both ways. I put special education services all together and then I've also provided it separated with the schools out of it and just special education district wide and the tuitions as well. So that way you can see what kind of dollars are being spent in each one of those areas. Okay. Tab 11 is our maintenance and capital planning. So our central service department in the city maintains our schools for us um, and is part of our school budget um, to maintain the six schools. Um, we have two shifts of custodial staff and maintenance staff um, as part of the facility and maintenance piece. We also have the utility costs, so the electricity, the heat, uh, water, sewer. Um, there is a separate worksheet on the last page of this section that has the utility costs that are projected. One thing that I did want to point out is the electricity costs. Uh, a few years ago, we had gone with a, a solar um, panel implementation, so that has started saving on our electricity. The past two, uh, last year, I adjusted slightly the electricity costs, and the year before, we had only had partial year. So we didn't have a full year's worth to know what the cost would be. So those numbers in the electricity piece have been changing a little bit the past two years be for that reason, um, as well as the net metering costs, because that's the flip side of that. Uh, let's see. Section 12 is anything that's con considered district cost. So this would be any cost that provides services to the entire district, not one particular school site. Um, so all the district-wide staffing, whether it's the attendance officer, the director of health, the transportation supervisor, the business office, the superintendent's office, the curriculum office, those would all be in the district-wide category um, and any of those costs that are associated with the district-wide. So again, we've done the FTEs and the budget for each one of those. Um, one of the. I'm sorry. I thought, I thought, I'm not sure if you were stretching. Sort of a broad question, but I think it's helpful. I don't know the answer to it. Um, 
when I'm looking at one of these pages, I see places where it says grant funded, mm -hmm. and then there's been a few other places that say lost the grant, so now we're covering it with our budget. And it's probably a question for Dr. Provost. Just how do we, when we look through this, think about longer term planning with when certain grants go, how do we make decisions about what just automatically gets absorbed in the budget versus not in terms of so we try to be very transparent about that in the budget discussions. When grants are running down often, we know in advance when they're going to be running down, we may get, in the ideal case, we may get a few years notice that the grant is not going to be renewed. And what our process usually is, if we decide the position is worthwhile keeping, is to try to build a portion of the grant, in, a portion of the activity supported by the grant into the budget in each of the ending years of the grant so that the final chunk isn't um, as big. So um, we've had a few positions like that. Um, one of the most recent ones that was uh, a position was like that was a nurse position that um, we had actually a three year plan where we did, we knew the grant was running out so, and we knew that our nursing services were just kind of basically making adequate and so we needed to keep the position. So we added one third of the position in the first year and had two, two thirds spent out of the grant. And then in the second year we had two thirds in the budget and the remainder spent out of the grant. And then in the third year, we absorbed the whole position into the appropriation. And one thing I'd like to add, so the grant that's um, we're including in the budget this year is be the inclusive preschool. So this is a grant that comes through the Department of Early Education and Care, so the EEC. Um, most of the school departments in the state have had this grant for more than 10 years. Um, three years ago, they gave the cities and the towns notice that you had three years and the grant was gonna end. So this grant has been long-term funding for a position. It wasn't just you get a grant and then two years later, the grant's gone. Um, it's been there for quite a while. Um, and the preschool operation is still going as well. Um, so they did give notice about three years ago that it was gonna end. So. All right, um, one thing that I wanted you to notice, uh, let me see which, so it's on the fourth page of the, the budget numbers in section 12. Um, the first account up at the top says nursing supplies on it. Just that way you can make sure we're on the same page. They're, they're, I'll explain to you how this whole thing's put together where there aren't number pages on everything. Um, so um, probably about eight or nine lines down, there's a line that's bus drivers. Um, that was one of the proposals that was put through um, as part of the first few budget was to add two FTEs of new 7D driver positions. Um, we have um, a capital funding request to actually fund a $50,000 van and another $70,000 to purchase a wheelchair van um, with the hopes that we would be able to provide better service and efficiency and transportation for all the students in town um, by having that flexibility. We're having a very difficult time hiring CDL drivers to drive school buses um, we own a fleet of four of our own school buses um, that are smaller wheelchair versions, um, but we're also finding the flexibility of being able to take those vans, provide some better service that we are now contracting out for, and provide better service trying to get students places in schools faster and also free up some of our bus routes for when we're having students that are on the outskirts of town and we need to send one bus all the way out to the outskirts of town to possibly pick up one or two children, that it adds 20 minutes to a bus route by shortening that and having the van being able to pick up preschool. We're getting the funding for the foster care um, that gets reimbursed to us in the city. We're fortunate that they appropriate it back to us. Between all those funding sources, be able to just about fund those two new drivers in that vehicle. Um, we put in a capital request so the city would pay for the, one of the vehicles and our bus revolving would pay part of it. That's what we've done normally for our bus replacement is pay part of it out of a revolving. The city would pay another part to replace the bus. This year we did not request to replace a bus. We actually asked for the two vans instead. 
trying to change that model and give us more flexibility. Okay. Um, one other items I wanted to mention on this page also is about halfway down, it also indicates that the school lunch price would increase by 15 cents. I just want to make sure everybody is aware that that's part of the proposal that we're doing this year as well. Member Sarah Ficon. Um, with that increase, would there be an increase to the reduced cost lunches as well? No, we're mandated by USDA that it's a set price. If you look at the line you pointed out, thank you for doing that, the two new driver positions, mm -hmm. the change looks like it's 66700 and in the first few budget, it was estimated at 50000 And Correct. my question is, is that difference to be interpreted just as the savings that we're going to achieve by not hiring other vans to drive, or is this gone up, or how do I think that, that would be the new drivers being added in addition to the salary increases for the staff that would be there as well. Thank you. Yep. Um, so Thank what you. you will see a little bit farther down, a few lines that say reduce contract service by 5,000. We've taken some, that's $10,000 out of those contract lines. We've decreased those to help offset the, the two new drivers. Okay. Uh, let's see. So tab 13 is our grants and revolving accounts. These are our grant listing. These are our current grants that we have this year. Um, and when we put the budget together, we've assumed that we'll have the same funding in 21, other than anything that we've heard won't be happening, like the inclusive preschool grant right now. Um, there's a few revolving accounts as well that we've, we've talked about. Um, I've given you some grant descriptions, so that way when you see the name of a grant, you'll, you'll understand what some of it is and what it's intended for. Um, some of the descriptions come right off the Department of Ed when we are providing that. Um, our revolving accounts, we've given you the fiscal 19 activity, so you can see what the balance was, the revenue it took in, the expenditures out of that revolving account, and the ending balance as of June 30th. Did I see that in the district one, from section 12, it said instructional coaches are part of the grant funds? Correct. And then, so in here does it describe which grant that is? Um, we are paying them out of our Title I and our Title II and our Title IV grant. Yep. So of this list of grants, this is what you're expecting us to have this year? That's what we, that's what we are, actually have award letters that we're spending this current year. And um, this is, this list I'm looking at is 2020, and you're saying 2021 similar. What we what we look at it, unless what we budget is, we expect that we'll have the same funding for next year, unless we've heard otherwise or we know otherwise. We assume that if we have positions there, we'll still be able to charge them there. Next year's grant money comes in, unless we've gotten notice otherwise. And is there are there any grants on here that you know might change? Not necessarily. 2021, but anywhere in the near future, should we be keeping our eye on any of these? Not that I've heard so far. They, they don't give us a whole lot of leeway. Um, it, it usually goes year by year, unless we, the only one that will, um, no, I was gonna say, none of them that I've heard other than the inclusive preschool is the only one that's a surety for next year, so that won't continue anymore, and I, and some of them are temporary, for instance, the turnaround assistance grants at JFK, which is about the fourth one down. That's just a one-year kind of funding for that year. So there's, there's stipend money, there's material money, but it's not supporting a salary. So I worry more about if their salary is being funded from here, is the funding source still going to be available? So is the new, is the proposed SEL coach? coming from the, I didn't see where that was listed in the, um, in the We've included that in the operating budget. It's in the op 20. not in the grant funding. No, one, one thing that's, it's one of those things that when I work in districts, I try not to charge salaries to federal grants um, because the minute you do, you lose 9% because a federal 
stipulation for the state is if you charge a salary to a federal grant, out of that grant, you have to pay the retirement funds into the retirement fund rather than the state paying into the retirement fund. So you lose 9% of every salary that you put in it. So I try not to put salaries in it. I'd rather put other things in it, costs of things, materials. But if it's already funding a salary, it's pretty hard to move it over if you don't have something to swap it with. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the revolving information, we've, I've included all the revolving accounts, so the athletic department's in there as well again, just so you, it's all in one place. Um, the next page is the school choice budget. Um, section 13, so right after when we were talking about the revolving accounts, then the athletic page, and then the next page is the school choice budget. So what we've paid out of school choice for fiscal 19 operations, you can see the revised fiscal 19 didn't change much. The fiscal 20 budget, that's what we are proposing this year that we would be spending out of it. And then what we have for the fiscal 21 budget. And we've itemized a list of items that we would be charging to the um, school choice budget revolving account. Okay. Sorry about missing something obvious yep. here. Is this also show somewhere where, I mean, are we also sending money out for the school choice as well? We are, but that's on the city side. We don't have to pay for it out of our budget. It comes out of the city. It's one of the joys of the choice program. Yeah. <laughs> sort of, it was one of the confusing things about the choice program. Right. We get the money they in. The we money, get to spend it, but they pay the the out. They get the, we pay the outgoing, they get the incoming, yeah. Sorry, thank you. <laughs> it gets taken off our cherry sheet, it gets taken yeah. off of our, yeah. 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 Can I, and there was enough, how does it compare to what we pay versus what we're getting in? I know you've shared that at other, I just, and looking at the number now here and all the different positions we have. Yeah. Um, there's a sheet a little bit further. It doesn't have the dollars, but it actually has the number of students accounted. So it, you can see the comparison of what's the number of students coming in versus going out. Um, to open the other budget to tell that, but I'll work on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember I've seen it. Uh, the next page is the special education circuit breaker budget. So we do plan part of our uh, special education tuitions will be paid for out of the circuit breaker revolving account. Uh, circuit breaker is for the high cost special education expenditures that we have. Um, we file a claim once a year with the Department of Ed. We're reimbursed for a portion of that the following school year. So that's where the revenue's coming in that we're then able to spend. It's also one of those items that we can keep the money in this account for no more than one year. So for instance, um, the dollar amount that we receive, we have to spend it within a year. So we can't keep it and build that balance. We have one year to spend it, and that's it. So we're, we received approval for 701 already next year, or that's your project? That's the estimated number that we're gonna get in this year, so we will be able to spend it, and we have to spend it right. next year. Right. Yep, okay. So this year we're spending 695. Correct. And we knew that last, okay. Yes. Um, so the, just the special education, and we'll get, to, there's a page on here I'll show you. So the circuit breaker piece, um, just so you can see the, the dollar payments that we, the revenues that have come in, and I say revenues, but they're really reimbursements, and the history of what it's been over the past few years. Um, I'm still on the circuit breaker page. Yep, well, the next one's circuit breaker too, so it's just it, revenue. It's striking how much it's grown mm -hmm. um, since 19 and 18 is it I guess it was more in 17 is that a formula at the state level is it just a random sort of what our population is if you take a look at some of the notes on the bottom in between 17 18 and 19 
there was at one point there was an extraordinary relief um, claim submitted. What happens is if you have a spike in your special education costs in a particular year, and a spike meaning a 25% increase in one year, you're allowed to put it in an extraordinary relief claim. They will give you money that year. You don't have to wait till the following year. Um, you get it that year. And when we, at that time, when they submitted the claim, they paid it. And then when they did the audit on it, they found it wasn't eligible and took the money back. So that's where you're seeing the difference of those couple of years revenue dipping down. So when they took it back, it wasn't there to spend. Can I speak a little bit more to that point just to um, maybe bring something else to the fore? If you look at the entire history from FY12 to FY2020, you'll see that the circuit breaker amount grew while the number of students eligible for the circuit breaker declined. Mm -hmm. That means that the amount, the cost of each of the students increased considerably. Because um, this is a formula driven reimbursement. The formula starts at four times the foundation amount. So um, the 32 students are about 120,000 more than the 43 students were back in 2012. Exactly. And it's just the population we have. And what happens also is the state every year when we're saying the, f the four times the foundation, that foundation number is going up every year. So one of the items that you have to look at also is as the cost of the student going and, and costing money each year, there's also that circuit breaker is a four times foundation. I refer to it more as a deductible. You have to pay the first dollar amount then anything over that amount is reimbursable at a percentage. And it's about 60 to 70%, sometimes it's been 40%. Um, that number has grown. When I first started doing this, that four times foundation was $35,000. It's now up to $44,000 per student. And part of the um, Student Opportunity Act, and we're waiting to get information, I just went to a training last week, they are looking at providing some of the transportation cost as a reimbursement as well. But we don't have any information as far as what part. All they've told us is how to claim it so far, and we'll see what we have. And each year, it would percentage reimbursement would increase. Can you just tell us for this year roughly what our foundation, what a foundation budget per student is? They've actually capped it now at the 44000 with the Student, student Opportunity so, Act. Like, is it, thir it's around, thir for it's, it's not ours, it's statewide. So they set it for the entire state. For She's talking about special ed. Yeah, I'm talking about just a regular ed student. Foundation? So is it, I don't need exact, but just so people know, 13,000 roughly, is that right? Uh, That's what the it, state yeah. average is 16.5 and Northampton's 15.2. Okay, 15.2. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Just to answer Mr. Gold's question from before, the governor's cherry sheet for FY 2021 shows that we will pay, the city will have to pay $588,502 in school choice sending tuition, uh, which is a 12.64% increase over last year. That's just what's in the governor's, you know, version of the budget, which is that same October 1st snapshot that she keeps referring to. Okay. Let's see, we've got the food service operation. Um, so um, we've got the revenues that come in. We've got the payroll for the staffing and the expenses for all the food costs and all the other costs related to the entire food service operation. This is also a program that is funded partially by the budget, our regular operating budget, as well as the fees and the reimbursements that are coming in for revenue. So it's funding from all three sources. Um, Fiscal 21, we are looking at, depending on the participation, and that's key to it, is the participation increases, it helps, but if the participation stays where it is right now, we're looking at that it would be a $22,000 loss with the school's appropriation right now. So we have to keep an eye on that as it goes to make sure that we're gonna be able to keep that participation increasing 
um, and with the breakfast program that's part of it so we're keeping an eye on that every day and the cost going up so we monitor that um, the school lunch price equity calculation is something that we're required to do every year um, they have us compare what we are required to have for a price versus what does the school committee appropriate towards that operation they let us count it towards that price so we can set our own price otherwise we would be expected to charge the price that they say we have to so for the current year the required price is three dollars Northampton pays uh, charges students two dollars and eighty five cents but because we put money from our budget towards the operation they equate that to being a three dollar and seventy two dollar price so we're above the three dollars so we're okay if not we would have to increase our prices based on that so for fiscal 21 we are uh, we're projecting it because there's no official required price out there as of yet it's three dollars and ten cents we're proposing to increase the school lunch price to three dollars and with these um, the local appropriation towards the school lunch operation will be at three dollars and ninety one cents so we will still be above the required price so we'll be okay Member Ross? I didn't quite follow the three dollars and ninety one where does what does that mean that's so that's what we charge students the three dollars and then also what the school department budget puts towards the operation they give us credit for which comes down and equates to 91 cents a meal so is it accurate to say that for students who are not on free or reduced lunch mm -hmm. the lunch costs three dollars and 91 cents and we are charging three dollars is that the right way to think about it probably pretty close mm -hmm. so and and I know this is more complicated but we are subsidizing the lunch partly we want to have a lot of participation to keep the numbers working correct so I, and the higher we charge the less, the participation, less participation may happen so it, it's a balancing yes thank yeah you. okay I think just I think we're charging 285 we're proposing we're right. right for next year yeah. the, the 391 right now, be for next two, year two Thanks. so um, I've included uh, the state it's just so you can actually see we actually file a claim each month our food service department does on the number of meals so we have to submit uh, reimbursement requests so I, I want to make sure everybody understands a reimbursement for food service doesn't mean whatever it costs you you get reimbursement for it's on the number of meals you get a certain cents worth towards each lunch each breakfast each milk um, based on whether they're free, whether they're reduced, or whether they're paid meals. Um, so this short, short sheet will show you, <laughs> that's a tongue twister, um, how much reimbursement we, we do receive from both the federal government and there's a slight state reimbursement as well, in addition to the paid meals is where we, the funding source comes in for those. Um, We've done some meal revenue analysis of the price increases. We have month by month how many meals we're serving. Um, so we're, we're projecting that it definitely would go over 12,000. I'm sorry. Yep. Um, if we charge $3 for lunch mm -hmm. and the federal, the amount we get back for a free lunch, do, are we allowed to take back more than $3 if that's what they're willing to give us? It looks like they, the total is. Maybe we I'm reading it wrong. Three dollars and forty-six cents. Is that what we take back? Is that what we're paid? That's what we get. Okay. So, I think that's just okay. Thanks. Um, Question. Yeah. Just going back on the school lunches. Back to the page before the explanation. So, what's, so there's the amount attributed for. Sorry, there. Go. Ahead, there's a school committee budget contribution to food service program so in school year 2019-2020 that was almost 70,000 mm -hmm. then what's the minimum school committee appropriation required is that required to meet that uh, we, could, we could bring it down but we couldn't bring it down any lower than th that it would equal three dollars and ten cents gotcha 
Okay, that's, that's the what lowest that required we can, amount. For, for next year when I'm saying mm -hmm. um, the required, um, and, and I'm, we're presuming the 310 right now because it's not official yet of the right. required price, so we've estimated it's 310. We could reduce the appropriation, however, the operation would have a deficit. Costs. Right, wouldn't cover our costs. Correct. So that 73,000 for next year is to cover our costs, cover the food services we, we're costs. We're planning, planning that, yes. If, if participation levels stay where they are and increase a little bit. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So I just, I just want to summarize what I think I heard. Mm -hmm. A lunch, if we count all the money it costs to provide, a lunch costs $3.90. No. Not that it costs that. That's no, what the federal it government. Costs to provide it. it um, That's what the federal government is telling us we should be charging. Not that it necessarily costs us that. It could cost us much more or much less. Okay. They set a standard rate saying everybody, everybody in the country should be charging at least this, at least this much. Three. Okay. So in other words, the USDA is saying we're not going to subsidize. So you can't charge students only a dollar for lunch and have the federal government pay the difference of everything. They want the communities and the students to be paying a relatively similar amount true to what it costs. But it's not necessarily the same cost as what it costs you to make that meal. Maybe I'll ask my question differently. I think I don't okay. quite follow, sorry. Um, so if, I'm just going to assume if we charge $3 for a lunch, mm -hmm. um, and then I'm not going to worry about free and, uh, reduced lunch. I'm just going to talk about the federal free lunch program. Yep. Um, and let's just say it's three dollars and forty six cents. So we go figure out how much money we bring in for all the kids that are getting covered in either way, right? Mm -hmm. And then we figure out at the end of the year how much did each meal actually cost us, right? Mm -hmm. um, which is a little different. All our expenses just divided by the meals. Correct. Does it come out? Is is that number here? Is it cheaper than three dollars and forty six cents, or is it about that? Or I can take a look at the average. I'm sure what's happening is some items are costing, some meals are costing more than others to prepare. Oh yeah, no. Yeah, right. so we can take a look at the average. I can get that information for you. I don't. I, I don't. I don't need it this year. Yep. I, for other committee members, we we spent a lot of time on this last year, and yep. just so people know, we're raising the price for. I think. Did we raise it last year? Mm -hmm. Yes. A yeah. little bit, yeah. and we just found we went up ten cents for this current year. We had we, talked about going up a quarter, and we thought it was too much of a jump. We at were once. lower than other yes. communities. Yes. Yeah, we did a lot of research, yep. and, and um, at, at the same time, I think it's important for us to keep our eye on it. Absolutely. Um, and I think at the same time, we're we're trying to do the participation piece as well, and increase that at the same time. So it's trying to be mindful of that. Everybody ready to keep on going? Um, so we've done some analysis for the revenue. We've got the school lunch year-ending closing balance, so that way you can see what the balances have. The past couple years, the balances have decreased. We've been dipping into revolving to fund the program. It hasn't, um, in addition to the school appropriation, um, some of the costs have just increased. I mean, the labor costs as well as the food costs have been increasing over the past few years, um, in addition to the budget support of it also. Um, in addition to one of those, uh, this operation, we also need to keep an eye on, um, there's some large equipment needs, replacement needs as well. There's some equipment that needs to be done. We've put in one capital request um, for one of the items over at the high school. Um, but, you know, refrigeration units, uh, they're larger units that cost significant amounts of money that we are going to need to address. Um, I've included a letter from the state about um, a breakfast challenge at two of our schools and that we've uh, participation percentage and how high they were so I wanted to include that information in there. Um, the Medicaid revenues, um, I wanted to let you know that that's something that actually is revenue that's coming in that's generated from the school side. It's any medical services that are being provided to students. We put in Medicaid claims that are Medicaid eligible services. Um, we have a claim that's prepared. Our staff prepare a lot of information. Um, Lower Pioneer Valley Educational Collaborative prepares the claim for Medicaid for us. Um, and we get dollar reimbursements based on 
that claim that's submitted. That is funding that uh, the revenue goes directly into the city. Um, so it does not come into a revolving account, but I wanted to make sure you were aware of the, the Medicaid revenue that comes in. Um, next page is the bus revolving. Uh, the bus fees that we collect are recorded in the revolving account. We pay for some of the expenditures out of there, so I've given you a history over the past couple of years of what kind of expenditures we pay, what kind of revenue from the fees we come in. So we're looking at uh, fiscal 21 revenues being about $110,000 from our fees, and we're planning on being able to spend about $98,000 towards our bus contract costs. Um, some printing, we usually pay for part of a bus replacement, as I indicated before. We're actually going to purchase one of the vans this year instead. Um, camera radio and bus maintenance on our vehicles and some fuel. Um, so those are items that we're looking at and then would still leave us a balance and that's the balance that we keep trying to put in there to replace the buses one each year is what we've been trying to do. And we have a list of um, all of our buses on the next page so you can see where we are um, currently right now. Uh, section 14, I've got some Department of Education information on here for you. So you'll see the foundation budget number of us over to the right hand side. The foundation budget, the total enrollments about 11,388 is what the foundation budget number is, which is the, different than our per pupil expenditure. Um, so the foundation budget is what the state is saying we're required to spend per student and then the city in Northampton spends a little bit more and we also have the grant funding and revolving accounts that we spend which bring it up to the $15,000. Uh, the next page, so this is all part of the foundation budget and how it's determined um, the city's ability to pay towards education what the community's wealth is determined by the state. So this is all state calculation pages um, that come in there. One of the things that we look at is the municipal revenue growth factor. Um, that number is keeping us a little bit above our foundation number, which is giving us a little bit of credit and decreases that minimum local contribution number. But um, the minimum local number right now would be at 82.5% is where that's the most that we could spend. And because we're at 82.6 right now, we get a little bit of credit. So as that changes every year, we're going to hit that 82.5% sooner or later. And when they take that dollar amount of what the city should be able to afford, then they split it between Northampton Public Schools and Smith Vocational Schools based on the demographics for the student um, foundation budget and the number of students at each school. So it, that city money gets a portion between two different districts, so to speak. Um, on the next page, I've got the Chapter 70 summary. And if you take a look at the trend going across the bottom, the five-year trend, you can pretty much see um, we've got some pretty minimal increases in Chapter 70. That line is very small increase. It's almost flat, but it's pretty much, which says that the state isn't contributing a whole lot more. The city is picking up the bulk of the increases from year to year is what's been happening. Um, on, on the next page with a district profile, uh, there's a column almost in the middle of the page that says percent change. And if you can take a look from the fiscal 19 up, they're 1.1%, 1.1%, 2.1%, 1, 1%, 1%. Those are the changes in, in Chapter 70 money. very minimal. Um, and the next is just a chart showing the same thing. You can see those lines about where, where we're spending, what's required to be spent, and what we're spending. Um, we are spending above as many districts are to keep the operations going. We're above what's required. And that's pretty common. Um, I've got a few charts and graphs in there of a number of different statistics, if you like. What information on that. It is interesting to just note on that chart that, you know, the Chapter 70 as a percentage of actual net school spending 
is going down, 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 while actual net school spending is going up, 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 up. So you know, you know who's making up the difference. <laughs> so I mean, it's just like we're we're having to make up the difference. Absolutely. So the last two pages in that section 14 are the actual Department of Revenue cherry sheet estimates based on the governor's budget. And I could have pulled out the school choice numbers in there. Um, so it gives you an estimated revenue numbers coming in and the charges that the city will pay. And that's on the, the city side, but that way you have the information. You can see where 20's budget stands and where 21's budget stands. And to wrap up section 15 is mis all the miscellaneous piece. So we have enrollment information. Um, the October sheet gives you the snapshot as of October 1, and it gives you by school, by grade, how many sections we have, how many um, class sizes in each one of the grades in each one of the schools. And what I did this year also is I include the December report because you could take a look from October to December in just those two months. We had an increase of 17 students in two months. So we're see, seeing an increase with the, the new construction um, and the new housing in town that we're seeing a number of increase in students, so which are affecting all different aspects of the school department. Where, where are you seeing? Um, it's section 15, the first couple pages are enrollment. The first one says enrollment for 2020. Oh, in section, so yeah, sorry, sorry. October. Yeah, sorry. And then the next one is December. So you can see in two yeah. months how much it's changed. The next sheet after that is our school choice, another in district enrollment. So that's where our school choice in is coming in. Um, the next section is choice and charter information. And this will give you the information about how much money is going each way, whether there's money coming in or money going out, and how many students are what we're looking at give you some historical piece of that as well. Do you have, well, do you have the charter, the similar uh, table for charter school? Um, I could take a look. It is um, a little bit further back, I yeah. see one. Yeah, isn't it um, right after the? Charter school slash school choice. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. And then we've got well, this. I, I just so I think I was looking for this this level of detail to me is really interesting by school or what, what school would have been and by grade level. I don't know if we've ever looked at that. This a similar one that you have here by choice. Do we? Can we even comprehend that? And do we have that by? Um, we we do have what grade level the school choice out students are would are at. Yeah. But we don't necessarily have what school they would be at here. We don't. Um, I'm trying to think if they have the street address on it. I don't think I've ever seen it. It just has the city and their name and the grade. Um, I'm noticing from FY10 through FY15, there was a gradual but marked increase in the number of students going to charter schools. Um, and then from FY19 to FY20, a significant decrease just in one year. Do we have any indication about why that happened? So that I can tell you we've been trying really hard to make our schools as good as they can be. We've also been trying to educate the community on the impacts of making the choice to use the charter school. And I think the two of those may have contributed to that. I'll also point out just along those lines, you'll notice that even though there was a marked decrease in the number of students attending charter schools, the amount assessed for those students basically stayed the same. Yeah. That's because in the charter school model, it yes. seems like the fund, the amount charged to charter schools go up no matter what, basically. The other thing I would say is FY10 was a pretty, um, if I recall, I think that was a fairly devastating fiscal year. That's when we had 
um, we had some pretty tough cuts happening. Yeah, probably 2008, 9, and 10. Exactly. That, that was, those were like, um, you know, the 08, uh, mm -hmm. last time the stock market crashed uh, yeah. badly, um, and we had the worldwide recession and yeah. mid-year budget cuts, and, um, and we had to do an override that year. 2009 for the FY10 budget. So, uh, what role that may have played, I don't know. I also don't know whether um, for, I, I, it would be interesting to look at the hi history of when certain charter schools opened, because mm -hmm. I think the universe has grown mm -hmm. as well um, in terms of options. Yeah. Um, so, that may also be part of it as well. So, yeah. Would it, is it possible to get what Member Coffin was talking about, where, what schools, because the, the choice one that you're showing is, on the choice sheet, is that's where they're coming in, right? That's coming in, yeah, those yeah. are slots. Those are entering. Right, so we, so we know where they are. Right, we know where they are. Is it, is it possible to know, I mean, because if, if we're sending out for a charter, I mean, we know what the families are, right? We know what their addresses are, I'm assuming. Could we find, could we? I'd have to dig a little bit deeper. I know we get the student's name um, and information, but I haven't seen their street address. We'll have to dig a little bit deeper on that about where we get that, because that's how we would figure which school they would go right. to. It has the grades on it, so we'd know if it's JFK or the high school, but if it was the elementary without their street address, I don't know if we'd have that, and I'd have to figure out how to get that. I haven't seen it readily available, but maybe if we keep digging, we could. Dr. We definitely can, can do that mm -hmm. exploration and see if we can find it. I will just add a couple of pieces. Um, one thing that complicates the, um, that question is that we also offer open enrollment within the city. So many students don't actually within the city attend the school where they live. So that, yeah. you know, I don't know how to factor that in, just say that that's, that's, a, that's a complication. The other thing mm -hmm. I'll just um, say, that I think is relevant because it was one of the findings of the survey we did on charter schools when we were trying to find out why people choose um, charter schools leaving. I remember one of the questions we asked is, had you ever visited the school that you were attend you know, your child would have attended if you hadn't chosen a charter school? And overwhelmingly the answer was no. So um, we're partially to your question, we're doing a lot of work to try to at least have families come in and take a look at our schools before they make the choice because I think that many people are very pleased with what they see when they realize what's happening in our schools. Um, so that, that was a very deliberate effort that started around the time that we got the information back from that survey. Just, I don't know, just, I mean, just looking at these, this is, this is pretty fascinating, like Ryan Road, more ten percent of the of the students I read this right in Ryan Road or Choice Den. And a little more than ten percent of the high school. And four kids at Jackson Street Choice Den. Um, it's just a remarkable difference. I just wonder why. I don't I have no idea why. I don't know where these kids are coming from. I don't know why, but um, it's just fascinating. <laughs> so yeah. Um, yeah. One thing, one, one thing that's important to remember with respect to that is we only allow choice to fill empty seats in classrooms. So uh, the number of slots available in a school mm -hmm. um, varies quite a bit from year to year based on the number of resident students who are attending those schools. And historically, Jackson Street has been one of the, one of the schools that serves a pretty large population center. Okay. Usually they just about fill with their own resident students and yeah. so there are fewer choice seats that we even open at Jackson Street. So that's another factor to consider Absolutely. when weighing what that means. Yeah. And along the lines of what you're saying about knowing where charter school elementaries would attend and also knowing where choice in district choicing, I forgot the right word for it, mm -hmm. whether choosing to go to other schools within Northampton. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I know that was a big part of when Bridge was doing work with uh, the FOSI group in Ward 3 Northampton, and understanding that would be helpful to know where to invest energy in, in terms of, like you were saying, like publicizing the schools and really making an effort for the community to know and get in there 
that would help that mm -hmm. effort to target that. So if there was a way to get that information, clearly not for now, mm -hmm. um, but <laughs> <laughs> not relevant right you now. Okay. But at some point, that'd be, that could be helpful to look at. Member Voss. Um, I just want to, this is more related to the choice conversation that's coming up on this page, if you don't mind. Um, I understand what you're saying about how we, we essentially fill spots with mm -hmm. choice. Um, and we can come back to that. But my understanding is once you offer a child, say, a spot in third grade because there was a space in the room, then we're committed through grade 12. And I wonder if that's, if I'm just a little surprised at, I think it was Member Kaufman who mentioned just what a high percentage of the high school is school choice. And is that the way to think about it? Or most those getting carried across, you know, once a, once a, Clap, a spot opens in a grade, maybe somebody left, and we add another choice in in the short term to fill a seventh grade spot we think we have, or an eighth grade or whatever, then we are committed to keeping those kids through high school. Is that the right way to think about it? I, I'm not sure that I completely follow you, but I'll think what, I'll give you what I think is the answer. What's happening is very much that dynamic that you just described of students leaving and another student coming in to fill their spot. It happens tremendously at ninth grade because students leave from eighth grade to go to Smith Volk. And so there's a whole batch of seats that opens up at that time. And so that's why the grade level that has the, the highest choice in every year is ninth grade. It's essentially replacing the students that went to Smith Volk from eighth grade. Which is over 100, roughly. So, right. So it's. 25 to 30 students per grade level. Okay, everybody ready to go? Um, so there's a school choice information there. Um, let's see. Uh, the municipal expenditure tab, I have, so you can actually see what kind of administrative services, other services, operational, and fixed charges that the city pays on behalf of school departments, our school department. Um, so the right-hand column all the way over to the end, you can see that this current year we're looking at $8.2 million worth of services will be credited to us at the end of the year on our end-of-year report that it's not actually coming out of the budget. It's an additional source of funds that provide services to us. Um, these are the capital requests sheets that were submitted in October. Uh, that's when the city's deadline was to actually submit for capital requests for this coming funding round um, for fiscal 21. So these were the items that were submitted in October um, by both the school department and central services. The next few pages are a lot of data that come from the end of year report. I will go through all of those. You can take a look if you want. They're all information by every category of how we spend every single dollar that in this report. Uh, the per pupil expenditure information tab that I have, it gives you a comparison through fiscal 18. Fiscal 19 information is not yet available. Um, it will be soon, hopefully it was supposed to be ready about a week or two ago, but I haven't seen it yet. Um, so on that sheet, you can see the difference. Uh, this is um, represents the total expenditures, and when I was saying um, the per pupil expenditure is from all sources. So Northampton is at $15,188 for fiscal 18. And the state average right now is $16,500 as of that year. And it gives you other communities so you can see as a comparison to where we are in that. Okay. Um, and the following information pages are either what we call function codes, so all the account numbers. So when you ask about the instruction, the instruction will give you that um, all those instructions, those are all the types of services that are considered in the 2,000 accounts. All right. Um, I've also got some terms that are used educationally. So when we start talking a little bit of jargon and lingo, if you haven't heard it, it might be some of the, or the, the, the letters of everything. Um, and then we've got a glossary of some terms that are 
talked about during the budget process as well. So I hope that you've been able to give you a little bit better understanding of some of those things. Glad to answer any questions. I know I answered them along the way, but we'll keep that conversation going in questions. Thank you, Cammie. It's a, it's a page turner. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, so. Do you have an audio book version? Yeah. <laughs> okay, but wait, you, want, you want to go to sleep tonight? Just that audio version. I understand. <laughs> Member Kaufman. Yeah, just a couple of things. Um, first of all, um, I want to thank you, Mayor, for the 5.4% increase. I, I brought this up a couple times, but historically we received about 3%. And I know the 544 is not only extremely generous, but is um, enabled us, well, enabled the uh, contract negotiations to get completed. So uh, thank you for that. Um, I also wanted just to thank everybody for their work on two and a half, um, the letter we wrote. Obviously, everybody wanted to participate with us. I'm assuming everybody supported two and a half, so congratulations, everybody. Um, this would be a much different sort of conversation if we um, if, if that did not pass. Um, I also wanted just to bring up uh, Member Buzanski and Member Fallon and myself had the opportunity to um, take Superintendent Provost up on his invite to attend the um, Superintendent's Roundtable. These are monthly sort of gatherings and on occasion it's very, uh, well I guess school committee members are either encouraged to attend or invited to attend. I had previously gone to one where the um, Executive Director of MASC was there, so obviously that made sense. Um, this time, rather than sometimes it's like the guest speaker is there or there's a structure or a panel, this time basically it was a lunch and each representative sat with their constituency. So we were fortunate to have um, Senator Joe Comerford sit with us. Uh, Representative Sabadoso was with another group of her constituents on the other side of the table, so we didn't get like that opportunity to talk with her as much. But um, it was just a conversation. It was just what's going on and what, why are we getting more here and when, where is this going? And I, I would invite you to say what you want as well, um, Member Buzanski. But we were both so impressed with the level of concern, the level of detail that Senator Comerford brought. She's so attentive to, attentive to all these things and she's not happy with a lot of it. And she's not ha she's like all of us, are very happy with the extra money that many of the really high needs districts got in the state higher than us, but she's very cognizant of many of the things that we just talked about, the circuit breaker costs, the transportation costs, the charter school reimbursement costs. And you know, it's it's hard to be optimistic, but it's it's it feels nice, um, felt nice to us, <laughs> I would say, to, to know that we had two legislators that were really in tune with our concerns and you just felt like they're gonna to continue to work. Um, so. I would just add that uh, I was most excited about Senator Comerford talked about uh, was it a special commission, a special committee on charter schools that she's mm -hmm. actually gotten started in the Senate and you know for years there just hasn't been any movement. There's been no appetite in the Senate to work on the charter issues is what we've heard and so to hear that Senator Comerford actually is starting to make some breakthroughs and really wanting to listen to and hear from all of us about um, what we feel are the charter school issues, and that's a lot of what we talked about at lunch. That was, and her knowledge base was so deep, it was really very impressive conversation. Really kind of one of the most optimistic conversations right. I've had in a long time, I feel like, in a lot of ways. And we are inviting her to come speak with the school committee, so I think that's in process, but you know. The superintendent and, and Representative Sabadosa, because as right. Member Kaufman said, we didn't get a chance to right. Sit with her and have that same. I don't think either one of them will be happy until we get better reimbursement for costs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Whatever that means. Um, the other question I had is just in terms of process. So we're, we're ending, I don't know if this discussion is over, but clearly um, you've been swamped with other things, and we all appreciate that. But last time we had the first budget, there was a number of questions that people had at that point and asked for some follow up. We've received um, some emails. I think all of us received it. Um, people wanting to know and, and making a case, or, or at least a better understanding. Uh, I think like the family and student engagement coordinator or something that's come up often. 
um, and there was a request for some additional data. So I don't know, can you, can, how do we go from here? Do we want to have that conversation now? Do we want to have it through emails? Do we want to wait until next next meeting? I just feel like, I don't, I'm not, I'm looking at you, but I feel like this is our discussion and our, we need to come up with something that takes all the matters into account, the strategy. So do you want me to respond or, or do you? <laughs> um, so, yeah, obviously I didn't get as far as I wanted to on answering some of the questions. One of the things that I worked on um, in the small snatch snatches of time I was able to get this week were job descriptions for any of the new positions because I think they really will um, sort of flesh out what what where the vision is for the new positions. So those have all gone to HR. I'm just waiting for them to come back from HR. And my hope is to have them in the budget book tonight, but we haven't gotten them yet. So well, as soon as those are available, I will share them with the committee. There are also specific questions people have asked that I will um, share with the committee. I will um, just use this opportunity to share out from the budget and property subcommittee last night one of the discussions we were having was that this year as in opposed to other years it seems like it's a little bit harder to to um, sort of coordinate the gathering of the public comments on budget because it, it i just get a feeling that different people are getting different pieces of information because sometimes i get something from a teacher for example it says oh i sent this to the school committee a week ago i forgot to copy you so i don't know if there are other things out there so i would encourage anyone who's gotten any feedback to forward the information to me and so that I can compile it. Um, we also, I honestly have to say, I don't recall where we landed on the discussion of putting together maybe something from the subcommittee that was just like a place where people could post comments. Um, so does anyone remember what the vote on that was? Um, Amber Gold, do you want to speak yeah, we to that? Um, we were discussing uh, sending a survey specifically to NPS staff to um, provide them with a link to an anonymous form where they can share feedback on um, the various proposals of additions and reductions, um, whether they want to comment on one of them or all of them or any of them, but just as a way to streamline so that in a way so that we're all, and then having that shared by the subcommittee to the whole school committee, so we're all seeing all the same commentary versus it just being who the, the public or, well, on that one, the specific, the teachers, but uh, on what teachers are sharing with school committee people. Um, and so the intention was thinking, well, if we could send that out shortly within the next week or two, we can collect the information from staff and then, mm -hmm. um, be able to all consider their feedback on those items. So it's not a survey. Not a, I'm sorry, not, not a survey. survey. Not a survey. Sorry. Just having kind of some right. anonymous way yes. form that teachers could fill out and give feedback on the budget. It literally is the slide from the superintendent's uh, but first proposal with like the 13 or 15 uh, changes that he wrote in the first few budget and just saying if you'd like to provide feedback on mm -hmm. this and it's an empty box. Right. You know, so it's not a survey of ranking things or anything like that. It's yeah. just feedback loop. It's a feedback, right yes. Does that be open to everybody? All educators? Or are you the in, the intention is to send it to and all NPS staff if that's acceptable mm -hmm. and yeah, I mean that's what we were thinking of unless I missed something from the meeting. But I'll just add one other thing. I think the mm -hmm. intent was to just encourage feedback in a way if people didn't want to email us, but not to say you can't email the mm -hmm. group and the superintendent, but just okay. as another mechanism to hear from people. So I want to say the other thing that I sort of envisioned for this, and I'm sorry I wasn't able to give it to you tonight, but we'll hopefully have for the next couple of weeks, is sort of um, what I've been calling tear-out sheets, which are like, um, menus with items from column A and column B saying if you want these three things this is what it costs here are your options of things that you can reduce in order to pay for these um, so that you might be able to sort of more structure in a more structured way go through the 15 different proposals mm -hmm. um, so hopefully I can realize that I think that might be helpful because there are so many different proposals in this budget you know it's far from you know, status quo, um, and 
each choice you make sort of constrains the next choice you make as you go down that decision tree. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But there were any number of us had asked questions last time, and, and is that something we should reissue our questions, or can you uh, look at the minutes and address them? Do you have the time to do so? I've, every question I've been able to answer, I've, I've forwarded to all of you. So there are a lot I haven't gotten to. Like, for example, I haven't gotten to creating the sheet for if we increase sub wages, how much you know, would that cost and what would some of the offsets be. So, so I haven't gotten that. Um, I know. So, right. so, what, so what, are, what should we do? do? I mean, can we advance this past April, um, the, the vote? Is that, would that help you? I don't even know if that's legally possible, our final deadline? It has to, it has to be April 15th by charter. Yeah. Okay. So we don't, is this, so you're saying you haven't gotten to it, and I totally understand why, and I totally appreciate it, and you don't know whether you'll have a chance to get to it. And we can't blame you for that. I mean, we just don't know what's going to happen. So what's the strategy moving forward is my, my guess. I mean, a lot of questions have been posed, and probably that's only half you're going to get when we actually now have the line items, and we know that two and a half is available, and we're getting feedback from the city. I mean, sorry, from the community. So I'm just a little wondering how, what process we will follow to make sure that all this stuff can happen. Um, and a lot of it rests on your shoulders. And can you allocate? Can you? I, I don't know. So I think we plan for some of this when we set the calendar for the school committee. Um, the opportunity, the first opportunity to vote the budget will be at the next meeting in two and a half weeks. But you know, based on past experience, we always want to have a backup. So the backup would be the April 7th, I believe the date is, meeting. And then I think when we were setting the calendar, we said we wanted to at least leave enough time to post an emergency meeting if we couldn't do it on the set. So there are will still be at least three possible choices between now and the actual drop dead date. But you know, we're talking a month from now. So I, I think I think we should I should be able to say with confidence I'll give you uh, is, is enough information for you to be able to make a vote before then. Yeah. Well that's what we all hope. I'm just trying to take other considerations into account and I guess we can't we don't know what's going to happen, but maybe some other colleagues have some ideas. Um, well, certainly in light of the conversation we were having at the beginning of the meeting, an emergency meeting was in my head. Um, and I'm wondering um, if it would be possible to set a tentative date. It wouldn't exactly be emergency if we have a tentative date, but at least then we would know that we would have some advanced planning for that. I'm just going to grab my calendar. I, I mean, not trying to violate a norm. Sure, sure, but <laughs> I mean, with the, with the knowledge that uh, it's possible that our March 26th meeting may be entirely taken up by uh, other circumstances in the world. So, um, our, our mode of meeting may, may change as well. Yes. <laughs> If the open meeting law well, can be changed. I can tell you that while we were having this meeting, um, Governor Baker issued an emergency order uh, temporary, temporarily modifying the state's open meeting law um, in order to allow state, quasi, and local governments to continue to carry out essential functions and operations during the ongoing COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, the emergency order suspends the requirement for public access to the physical location where a public meeting is taking place. Uh, provided there are other means of access available. This includes use of uh, phone conference lines, social media, and other internet streaming services, online services, or other methods of access. Um, and they've also relieved the requirement that a quorum of members be physically present at a public meeting, meaning that all members could participate remotely. Um, that just came out, um, and it applies to local commissions, boards, and committees, as well as regional quasi and state meetings it does not apply to town meetings however so i don't know how what, what town meeting is going to do um, so but i think we don't have a <laughs> ironic it is ironic i don't know it's, right yeah. so anyway so that 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 may change how we even hold our meeting depending on where we were our next week or in the week after we may be all phoning in so my initial thought is that we could hold April 13th as the backup. 
we would know on the seventh whether or not we had a successful vote and would give us enough time to post. That's Monday. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does that work for anybody? April 13th. Mm -hmm. Monday, a, a particular time for a tentative emergency meeting. <laughs> 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 Six forty-five normal time. That's fine. So just put a placeholder in there. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that'll be here at JFK until we decide. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and how soon will we just? How will we decide about next meetings? We understood that we couldn't have this meeting remotely, but we'll be working to understand. I mean, this is just a right. flash, and there's a longer order, so we'll have to figure that out. Okay. Um, what that means and which boards it applies to. I assume it'll apply to the school committee. Um, and so we'll just have to work out the logistics of that. I'm sorry, sorry. Remember leaving. So should we expect to be receiving answers to our questions via email before our next meeting or should we be expecting to discuss those answers to the questions at the next meeting? Before the next meeting. Cool. And as a follow up to that, if we did, weren't having this extent, this extreme circumstances right now, is the normal process that you would like there would be discussion and not vote on the same day of a school committee meeting, like where we have an opportunity to hear where everyone else is standing on the budget and feedback and get your answers and all that. Like, is so the no. Well, what I'll say normal, this will be my seventh budget here. The first five passed on the second meeting in March. Last, the last year, it was held off to April because of negotiations and, and what happened there. So, um, you know, I'd say what, what would be normal is you would ask questions, I would give answers, you would talk about what you thought of the answers at the meeting and make a vote. Um, but we know that sometimes the discussion stimulates more questions, and so that's what the reason for the backup date in April, and now we have two backup dates in April. I guess just sitting here making a plan, I feel like I agree with all of this, but I also feel like I have things I'd like to talk about now just based on responses we've already gotten. Um, I don't, you know, just... I don't think there are questions that are out of the blue, but just where I'm at, some of the emails we've all received, and just to start having that conversation, um, if people would be okay with that. And I'm going to ask a, just a tactical question before we get to that. What is there a proposed date, and sorry if you already said this and I missed it, that you would have the form response available to all the educators in the district? Like, do we have a timeline for when we think we would get that feedback back? Well, uh, so what I could say is that I sent out the draft. We had our meeting yesterday, and I sent out the draft today. And so as soon as it's okayed by the superintendent, if he's able to do that, then I can imagine it would be open immediately to um, staff would all just get the email and then as, you know, as it comes in, the idea would be like the budget subcommittee and as and the rest of the school committee would be able to go in and view is there any new comments or responses. And so. when you send that out to teachers, are you planning on giving them a, a deadline like we need your feedback by this date? That's a good question. We didn't discuss that piece I mean I think it should be prior to the next meeting yeah I'd imagine yeah that would make sense to, to try to put that out there for sure before we do get into I wanted to respond to that a before we get into discussion um, like how much more is on our agenda if and like what can of worms are we opening here in terms of the timing of the evening? Like if we, like our, mm -hmm. I, I, mm -hmm. I, 
I think we need to have, so I guess what I'm wondering is, because we also have this that takes, like, like as we do the discussion, like it's kind of like we really need to read this before discussing, or maybe we have to. In some ways, it'd be helpful, it'll inform us by reading this, and so. Um, I was going to ask if we could, uh, when we got to it, I was going to see if we would want to hold off on even just the policy discussion, you know, the, the section on. Mm -hmm. Member Fallon is not even in right. attendance. Exactly. So I felt like those could be deferred to a future meeting. I think the vote, the two votes on, well, the Italy, the Italy field trip seems like that won't take very long. <laughs> and uh, school choice participation one is a fairly, you know, that, so I mean, those seem like we could get those done, and then it'll be up to, you know, then, um, we've sort of already had the, and I think the report on collaborative for educational services could be put off because Member Fallon's not here, and then I think, I don't know if you're going to have a big business administrator's report. I think I've said enough tonight. You've said Can you pack it if anybody has questions? Exactly. I'll be and then the superintendent already gave his report. So really it would just be just, uh, just, uh, Member Kopp and your discussion if you wanted to put that off. So I mean, we could, we could definitely move some things off into the future if we didn't think they were critical tonight. If we wanted to spend more time on the budget. Member Bob. And, and I, I appreciate that, and I think, I know the two of you especially are tired, and so I'm not trying to enter us into an extended evening, so maybe I'd propose 15 to 30 minutes on this topic or something, and at least so we can each have a chance to say where we're at with it or how we're thinking, that kind of, if people want to go longer, that's fine, but I, I, I just don't want to not do any of it. And and not to use time to, for a plan, but like how much time, like are you, what the member mayor, mem the mayor was saying, <laughs> um, do we need time to do, like where are we at on the other pieces? Because I do want to honor the fact, like it would be great to get out of here by 1030 tonight, like if that was even, you know, or earlier. Mm -hmm. um, I would love it to be earlier, but I wouldn't want, you know, I don't want us to feel rushed on things or not heard and all that, so do we need to get these other things in there? Uh, if you're talking about my item, I could I can make that brief. Um, I'm okay. not sure. Was it weren't we supposed to talk about agenda? Or was that <coughs> those are the policies that were <laughs> put off. Oh, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Gotcha. Yeah. I missed what that rules and policies is the agenda. Sorry about that. Okay. So I mean, so we're still on budget, so we need to make a decision whether. So it sounds like we want to have more discussion on budget yeah. for now, so, and then we can see where we are. Mm -hmm. with the other items yep. can we tell me if this is not allowed but can we come back to budget and just get through the other things we need to get through and then come back and do the budget with whatever time we have left so that we I mean I it sounds like they're gonna be fast doesn't seem like I don't think there's a problem I'm looking at the parliamentarian is that okay with I think we can just I don't know <laughs> sure <laughs> So I, I, I have one other item. Yeah, left on I mean we we, we can two. we can certainly. I mean I think you can move, oh, three. move to an item and come back to it. I mean, if, I mean it's up to you. I mean the the um, the two votes are fairly simple, so I don't know that it will take us three that long. We may have talked about them longer than they would take. Yes, yeah. exactly. So we need to move to those and then come back. Sure. To the so great, um, great, second. Perfect. <laughs> I'll, I'll just accept that as a yeah. unanimous <laughs> consent request. So um, obviously number F is a, oh, I'm sorry. I just wanted to request, we had talked about um, discussing the norms um, and standards at the next meeting because we were going to address the agenda today and yeah. we're not going to address the agenda today. So I just want the committee to recognize that we'll just attend to the norms and standards and vote on that at the meeting after the meeting where we address the agenda piece. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. So the first item is um, a vote to revoke permission for uh, a, feel, a previously approved field trip to Italy. Um, and uh, Superintendent Provost? I don't think it's such a good idea. <laughs> I don't think they're accepting visitors right now. <laughs> um, so could we get a motion to revoke authorization for that? Motion to revoke. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
<laughs> Thank you. Hello there. Condon was kind of quiet. <laughs> yes. Um, okay, uh, so that passes. And then the next one is an annual vote that's required to basically continue our participation in the school choice program. Um, which obviously is important because that revenue is built into the budget that yeah. Jimmy has uh, presented. So I would entertain a motion to continue the district's participation in the school choice program. A motion to continue the district's participation in the school choice program. Is there a second? second. And I'd like to just discuss briefly. Okay. Um, so I don't want to make this a big conversation this year and now with what everything's going on, but I would like at some point maybe budget and property subcommittee, maybe some other group, to understand this decision better. It seems like historically we just vote it through and I understand it does bring money in, we fill these spots. But these numbers, actually I asked for these and we got them without the email, so thank you, Cam. Um, one question down. Yeah, one question <laughs> down. Um, but it, there, some of them are surprising, I wanna digest them, but the fact that 90 is you know i don't know 12 15 percent of our high school is school choice and they they're coming in in ninth grade just begs the question there and elsewhere how much is it really costing us in terms of serving all those students and and it, it's it's a complicated question but to go back to it we're, we're told the state to educate a student we're supposed to spend eleven thousand some and we're really spending around fifteen thousand so our community's dollars are spending a lot of that difference. And school choice, I think, brings in 5,000 per student, is that right? It's a flat rate of $5,000 per student. If the student is a special education right. student, then you get the actual costs for their special ed services. But, but we are getting $5,000 a student. And the argument that if you have a, just an off year, say in third grade, and you want to add a couple kids to make up for that, that $5,000 might be worth it. But if it's somewhere else in the system, it, I'm not convinced it's always worth it. And there's definitely trade-offs, but we're spending a lot more per student than the 5,000 we're bringing in. And I just think we should understand that decision better. And like I said, I don't want to vote against this tonight, but I, I do want to put that out there for us to understand it better. Okay. So all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. aye. Opposed, any abstentions? Okay, so that one is um, adopted. Um, and then I think we'll just, uh, there, is a, there is a vote to refer some policies to the Rules and Policy Subcommittee. That seems like it's fairly straightforward. Um, would someone like to make that motion? That's just a referral vote. Motion to refer policies ACE and IHB to the Rules and Policy Subcommittee. Is there a second? Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Any abstentions? Okay, so that is referred. Um, and so, um, and then we're going to just defer on J, which is the report to the Collaborative for Educational Services. Um, so that leaves us the discussion under E and D, um, uh, you know, E and then going back to D. So, what, what is your pleasure? Would you like to, um, Member Kaufman, would you like to do that discussion in E before we go back to the budget discussion? What would your sense be? Sure, maybe, maybe we can just delay it. Let me just at least get 30 seconds, if I can get 30 seconds just to say what sure. the issue was. Okay. And, um, so I actually have received a couple of questions about what the role of the school district liaison is. We actually have, we have, um, <coughs> we, we have subcommittees, and then we have some represent, they're called representatives, like, um, List here, uh, capital gains, capital improvement representative, collaborative for education services representative, health advisory committee representative, and then we have it, uh, liaisons. I hadn't read, re I had not read all of them, but legislative liaison, NEF liaison, etc. So there's this group of folks that we got assigned to, um, and I got some questions on like, what is the role of the liaison? Are we supposed to come back and bring things back to the committee? Um, is there a standard idea behind this, or is it just what's happening historically? And I realized I had no idea because this year is the first year I've served as a liaison, and um, I am with NEF, and I already have. I'm a little confused myself what my role is. So. 
because because I had I couldn't answer that, and because I was confused, and I know at least a couple of other people were, I wanted to not only raise it really as a discussion, but really had, I had some questions, and I thought it'd be worthwhile to investigate how we want to move forward with this. Do we? What what are our expectations? So. I'm happy to wait until the future, but the longer we put it off, the more meetings that I'm going to have any of and be confused with. And some of you also might have some meetings coming up, so I guess I would just take a pulse of the group whether this is something that you want to spend some time talking about today and seeing if we can come up with some sort of definition or expectation for liaison slash representatives, or um, like I said, I'm more than happy to, to put that off, but I don't want to leave people who are asking me questions in the lurch, especially since I'm one of those people now asking questions. <laughs> yeah. Busansky? Do we have a do we have it in any policy or any kind of description of the um, I think they've just sort of grown historically over time. Mm -hmm. um, I mean when NEF was formed, it was formed with some, you know, community members and some school parents and some actually I think a school committee member and so I think the idea was to have some kind of a liaison from the school committee um, just because these were grants that were being offered to the schools and that the schools committee would ultimately you know is overseeing the educational you know goals of the school so um, I used to serve on the NEF board just as like a before I was ever an elected official and so and there was just there was always Lucy Hartree was the representative and so and I think that's just one that obviously you can't be required to put a liaison on there um, it's not like they can compel us it's not like it's anything statutory or I think it's just one of those ones that historically um, the NEF I mean the school committee thought it was a good they requested and we thought it was a good idea and so it's just been one of those historical things so that's an example of one that's just sort of happened mm -hmm. um, the the Northampton Open Media one is actually one that um, they have in their bylaws, oddly enough. Um, we don't have it. So they, um, again, I think because they're an organization that's actually based in one of our schools um, mm -hmm. and has a pretty close collaboration with our technology department um, and lease space from us, um, I think they thought it was important to have some representation from the school committee or you know on the board so that was one that I think they requested but again it's not they can't compel us to send a representative so and I've never been the representative so I don't really know um, how that how valuable it is there's I mean the only one that's really mandatory is the collaborative mm -hmm. um, that one as a condition of our membership uh, we're require every all of the collaborative members have to send a representative from the school committee and the report that Member Fallon keeps trying to give, but it doesn't work out. Is actually required as well. That they're supposed to give a report back to their school committee. Um, so they're sort of yes, yeah. Um, and I think it's the way collaboratives are formed under Mass General Law that it's, yeah. the composition of them are made up of school committee. It was, it was actually a bit of collaborative reform when there were some collaboratives that were. It was basically unclear how they were spending the money they were getting from their member districts. Yeah. Um, so they're all over the map. Um, so, yeah. Members. I guess um, maybe akin to how we've kind of developed our norms, I would appreciate a straw man proposal, as it were, <laughs> straw person, uh, something to kind of respond to. I don't, like, we could create things out of thin air tonight, but that doesn't seem like a Good use of our time. What's, the, what's that analogy? What you're talking about finding if, some, if an existing document exists from another district? Is that what you mean? Or oh, I just meant. Uh, well, if I, there is something in our in, in our existing documentation, or right. if other districts have it, sure, that could be the basis. I just meant like instead of asking so, a very yeah. open-ended question, coming to us with uh, two sentences or three sentences of a suggestion. Member Gold. Um, it, I think it does, in, especially with the other item on here, I think it, it takes some thoughtful discussion. And also in the lens of like, thinking of it as a new person who's a school committee member, um, 
like knowing what those responsibilities are, and you know, I kind of like dream that there might, like for the next, whoever comes on next in two years, like there's a packet that describes you're gonna take on a liaison role, which means this is what it's gonna be. And so I would say like, I mean, I don't wanna keep pushing things. I know it doesn't work to push it to another agenda, but I feel like it's a longer conversation. Um, and because I think like it opens up, are there other liaisons we should be having or not be having, like in thinking about our community. And so maybe we could find another way to, another time to discuss it. Member Ross. I, and I'm not trying to um, make this not an important thing, but I, I just want to put out, I think we together collectively have so many things on the table right now between the busing and everything that's going on with the budget. And I just would wonder, I mean, my response to the question is, we have all these liaison per places when people see a need, we should definitely suggest if we should have another one, but I don't know, my view of it is it's pretty simple. Um, they're all probably different. Some of them required, some of them not. Your role might feel different, and I'll just share when I was CPAC, I didn't know. Um, I talked to the leadership. I said, what can I do to support you? Um, they told me what they wanted, um, and that's kind of how I felt like my role was, and it might be different as it goes on, so I'm not even sure I'd want to write a definition of what they want. It depends what people are comfortable with, but then, I learned that I, you know, when I come to a meeting, I would make an announcement about what's going on that was public that they wanted shared. And I mean, I kind of think that's what a liaison is, and it looks different for these different activities. But I'm also kind of comfortable leaving it yeah. at that. I don't know what other people think, but. I, I mean, I think, I, yeah, I, I, I think maybe it's deserving of a larger conversation, but it, it does leave me wondering. Um, basic things like are we are should we come back and report uh, should the legislative liaison be the person we talk to or can we go directly to our legislate to our legislators should we um, we expect it to be part of their advisory board if we're invited or is that a conflict of interest so those are kind of core things uh, and I'm I'm I, like I said I, I just think some of those stuff would help just to get clarity but right now, I agree with you. What we're trying to, what we're really doing is everybody just kind of wings it and does what they feel is important. And I, by no means, want to get rid of any of these on things. I just want further clarity. So, um, but it sounds like it might grow into something bigger. The, the, I mean, I should say the discussion might warrant some more attention. So. Okay. So we'll look for a space to do that, and yeah. 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 Okay. Um. Okay, so now we're back up to D, which is um, the FY21 budget book. So I, Member Voss, you said you had some items to discuss um, or questions. Yeah, I'm just trying to figure out how to frame it and not and just kind of get it started, but not say too much. Um, where I'm at with, and I, obviously we need to study the budget and hear more feedback, but just to start the conversation to say where I'm at, I, I feel like we went through these um, retreat-like workshops in December and January as a committee, and what was really stressed to us by the MASC members who, who or field officers who talked to us was tying the budget to district goals and it seems like a good time in our process to just say that out loud remind ourselves and talk about what that means um, we're at the end of the district improvement plan I wasn't here when it was produced I, I reread it it's, it gets pretty vague for this year um, and I think over the next year we're supposed to develop a new one and so it's not easy to tie the budget exactly to those goals at this point. Um, and we also have the district review that came in recently, and I know Dr. Provost plans to have a discussion about that in April, I think. Um, and so as a school committee member, the job might be to tie the budget really closely to the district goals, but because of where we are in the process, that's a little harder to do. So, you know, I feel like Maybe this year it's a little more lenient in that way, but I, I guess I want to make sure we're headed in that direction in a more um, uh, structured way for the future. And with that, I still am viewing some of what's been proposed through this lens of 
what the district goals are. And I sit here just reading all the emails that come in and thinking about the WINS model and how we're still trying to support that part of our school district. And I have concerns about some of the reductions in terms of the support, ex many of the reductions, but especially the ones where we have teachers in the classrooms at the elementary schools. And you know, I don't want to be too nitpicky, but that's sort of where I am big picture with this. I feel like we hear over and over through emails since I've joined the committee at different elementary schools, just the needs and a lot of it's behavioral stuff of the kids and the need for more adults in these classrooms. And I feel like tying up this round of budget of district goals and where you've really put the energy to make positive change, I want to see us make sure that we're not taking steps back in those things. So. Yes, Member Seraphie Cox. I guess I would just um, say that the, the themes in the communications that I've been getting um, from the community really revolve around the special education teacher reductions. I've heard a lot of concern around that. I have not heard one person who says that they support it. Um, and uh, and so I I guess I will just say that I'm I'm really concerned about that part and I do see um, things on the addition side that I would be willing to cut in order to restore those positions. Okay. So is that um, sounds like it's a, one of those possible tear outs you were talking about right. or yeah or whatever that's I called. I thought you were already planning that one. <laughs> That, yeah, yes. <laughs> Member Gold. Um, along, with, like, would it, um, would it be possible, because I think when we were talking about, getting, one of the questions was getting feedback on what it would look like with these reductions, like the impact on the schools. And I think you did a, a thorough job of explaining the additions and having slides on the additions. In a way, like having for each of the reductions, like, what this really looks like. It's because while I agree the messaging has been, the, the message, or the primary messaging has been um, against the cutting the 2.5 special education teachers, like I haven't gotten many emails or, I, or that we are, at least that we've all received, like saying yes to lots of things, you know, it's mostly like concerns about the pieces, so I wouldn't know, I mean, is silence complicit? Is everybody else okay with the 2.5? You know, it's kind of hard to judge based just on what we're hearing. And so, to be able to answer and say what that 2.5 reduction really means, like what that exploratory really means in the reading and, and all those pieces, um, I think would be very helpful in having confidence in that I'm voting knowledgeably versus just assum assumptively, if that's a word even. Mm -hmm. I just want to second that. I think, um, you know, in our initial conversation, I asked a question about why JFK was, was saying they were going to cut the exploratory teacher just as an example. And it, 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 didn't do, it didn't occur to me that they didn't want to cut it. That it was just they were told they needed to cut. And so to be able to understand what's the impact or the potential impact of all of these cuts. So are we losing a, a third of a science teacher in the high school because it's not needed? What would that do to the sizes of the science classes? What would that do to the potential offerings of the science curriculum? I think all of that would be really helpful in understanding those cuts. I have a very specific question. Um, I received an email today from the ETL at Northampton High School saying that their position is on here as a reduction. Can you uh, point to me wit what they're referring to? Yeah. Um, the ETL position, I'm just, I'm going to go into tab two. Oh, it's in the set piece. That's why. It, it, yes, it's on the set piece. Yep. Okay, I was just looking at the wrong page. Wait, wait. wait. Um, here. Special education. Uh, in this, I had the same yeah. question, but I didn't catch up to you. What, what uh, do you it's mean by the set piece? So, so it, it's that 
that H baseball H reference that he made. Um, I assume it was baseball? Soccer. Soccer. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Not everything with you is about baseball? Okay. Um, the, the, it's the, the page right before the, the slide that we've been staring at all night. Um, the adjustments if override succeeds right before that is special education set piece and the ETL at the high school is referenced there. Did you get, did that answer your question? I found that and I, I have the same question. Well, my question was just, I don't see it in the budget. What, where is that? Um, but if you have further questions. Yeah, um, I think we probably all received the same email and I guess the question is who, who would perform, how, how is that work gonna happen? What's the plan? So I began giving an answer to that the night that this was presented. Uh, I will come back with details that you've been asking for all of these things and that will be included in there. Um, basically that um, work will be done much as it is at other schools by the special education staff. I will also point out that within this whole model that position is going away, but another position is being created that the person could slide into. Because the 504, the Section 504 coordinator roles are very similar to the ETL roles. It's just that instead of doing special education, it's Section 504. And how many uh, FTEs are there in the ETL role? That is, this 72,000, is that multiple roles, or multiple FTEs? It's one. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do we have ETLs at other schools? Oh, sorry. The only oh. other school in ETL is JFK. Oh, that, so that position would stay? So what I heard you saying is that the person who is in the ETL role now could slide into the high school clerical 504 position. Is that the, correct? The, the middle school 504 position. And then that would leave an additional 0.5 position that would, we would be able to find something for that person. Okay, I'm just looking at the 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 salary, the mm -hmm. salary differential, and thinking that um, that right. might not be a, a the re right. The reason because at the time that we created it, we were using a hypothetical salary for the new position. I think we use Masters Six as our hypothetical for all new positions. So now that we're thinking about where things could actually move, that would be a difference. I see. Um. Member Kaufman, you have a question next. I think you've been waiting. Yeah. No, no, no. I, <laughs> you've been waiting patiently. Okay. Um, so one of the things I think we've all been hearing a lot about, including tonight, is the two, two and a half um, special ed position that you're uh, that you're um, cutting, that you're advocating we cut. But last meeting, Josh had talked about that. I think. And I'll admit I was a little confused with his discussion. And because we went there last time, and because we're hearing a lot about it, is do you, can you can you capture that uh, information as to why that's happening and why he he seemed to talk about it as as a neutral thing? So I see worth getting some more information out there. So I'll just say this: my background is in special education. Right? So one of the ways that you assign staff is through creating what's known as loading charts where you load case loads onto individual uh, educators. So one of the things that I actually was able to get to but didn't bring tonight is um, what the loading charts at each of the elementary schools would look like under the new proposal. So you'll be able to see what case loads would be. So I think that will help you making the decision about whether or not that's a good trade. Um, so we have Basically what Josh was saying was that the impact will be minimal because of changes in population and the way staff are currently deployed. Um, I, we looked at, and I'll also say this, uh, one of the things that we looked at, I think I mentioned this when I was doing the first few budget, are what are the differences between us and the districts that are similar to us but performing higher? And the um, two districts that we selected because they're reasonably similar 
and the only ones performing higher in our group are Longmeadow and Cambridge. Mm -hmm. When you look at how we spend the district, how we spend the, the budget according to those categories that Cami was explaining in this budget book, you can get the report for each district. Looking at percentage, in every percentage, we're virtually equal, except um, we're, we're lower than the higher performing districts in the areas of professional development. And the only way we can do professional development in our district is through coaching because we don't really have professional development days. So, and the coaching model actually has worked really well. So that sort of started us down the path of looking at well, where might we want to make some adjustments to improve achievement in the district. Um, and then what we did was we also looked at what are our special ed teacher to special ed student ratios as compared to those two other districts. And we found that we have almost half the caseloads that they're running in those other districts that are performing better than we are. So that convinced us that that may be a place where we can make some adjustments. But I, and I can, I can share that information with you too. To clarify, you mean on the half the caseloads, I think if I understood you correctly, that the other districts have, for instance, like an eight to one, but we have a four to one. Is that what you're referring to by the caseload, like per staff member, or those aren't the actual? No, those are the actual numbers. Yes, that's that's the yeah. scenario. We're we're staffing more. We have a lower ratio of student to special ed. Right, and we still Sorry, would teacher. even yeah. after what we, I can show you is even after making the adjustments, we would still have a lower student to staff ratio than those other higher performing districts. But we'd able to get some money that we could put to professional development and some other things. Member Voss. Um, I know it's different in each of the elementary schools, but my understanding is with the WINS model, the idea was to develop some co-teaching and to have, suppose you had two classes of a certain grade and teachers in each of those classes and then you'd have a special ed teacher that would support both classes, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so, with that model, even if the special ed teacher didn't have as high a caseload as maybe you would expect in some cases, wouldn't that special ed teacher would support those two classes at the same time too, I assume. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know, can you talk a little bit about when, when we see 2.5 special ed teachers being um, reduced for other things, how, do we think about there being enough teachers in the classroom? One of the, so you're right, and this, this actually goes back to the discussion we were having last night at subcommittee. In the original, what I called the purest model, you had two teachers in every classroom. We ended up not going with that. We did the modified wins because the reductions in ESPs that we would need to make in order to get to that point would be too much. Um, so. The model we ended up with was a special education teacher per grade level. We would still have a special education teacher per grade level after making these reductions because at Bridge Street, at Ryan Road, and Jackson Street, you have more than one special ed teacher per grade level right now. Those are some of the numbers you'll be able to share. Yeah. Yeah. And, and would you be able to share the scenario of what that actually means. So like right now say there's two special ed teachers at in second grade at Bridge, mm -hmm. for, for example. And so next year there would be one special ed teacher at, at a grade level. Right. I mean, is that where there's the co-teaching model with a special and a general teacher in there and now it's a floating thing? And then how, is there a plan in place for when that teacher needs to intervene with one student and now the special education teacher is occupied with one student and isn't able to service the remainder of the kids when they were originally floating, if you know what I mean. Like, so yeah. I really understand that scenario. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, can, I can provide that. Member Goldman. I'm sorry. Are Cambridge and Longmeadow also implementing a WINS model? I don't, so Cambridge and Longmeadow both definitely have inclusion classes. They have not, um, to my knowledge, done the same, the same model we've done. Are there other um, 
districts do you know of that are working with the winds model that are comparable to my district? Yep. Um, the two schools that we kept um, kept referring to when we were building the model were both schools in Boston public schools. I'm not. I don't recall their names off the top of my head, but um, yes, there there are other schools that have the model. And actually, the model originally did, um, originated in the Midwest, um, and there it wasn't even a special education model. It, it was just a class size reduction model. Um, and act, actually, I shouldn't say class size reduction. What they were asking is, would it be acceptable to let class sizes grow to put two students in each, or two teachers in every classroom and so there it was, um, they did an experiment. They said, we're going to hold a teacher, a classroom with one teacher to 15 students, but then allow a classroom with two teachers to go up to 30 students. And they found that those larger class sizes actually did much better than the smaller class sizes with one teacher. So um, that that's, was the real origin of the model. Member Voss. Um, comment and a question following up on that. I, I was wondering the same thing in terms of Long Meadow and Cambridge, if they have the same student population. Um, we used to have programs that some of our higher need students were part of, and you know, I don't know if Cambridge and Long Meadow do or if we're looking at the same kinds of support needed. Um, and I guess that's a comment unless you know the answer. I do, I do know the answer. So the um, dark the DART, which is a tool we use to take a look at comparable districts, matches on two dimensions. One is an economic match, and one is a um, student uh, student population match. So for Cambridge, we match on student population. For Longmeadow, we don't match on population, but we match on um, economic factors. And, and then related to all this, I'm just brainstorming and throwing out how you think about this with the additional ESPs in the first grade. I feel like this is echoing. Um, some schools have two first grade classrooms and some schools have three. Three. So if we look at a school, I think Ryan Road has two first grades. So I'll use them as an, and does Bridge Street have two first grades? I think they have two now. Okay. Uh, they've got a couple of threes. Okay, yeah, don't worry sure about it. It doesn't matter. Two first grades. I counted, I think there's 10 first grades across the district. And yep. I think those are where the two are. And so if we add a first grade ESP at each of the elementary schools, um, and we also have a first grade teacher and a special ed teacher for first grade, mm -hmm. you end up with four professionals, teacher-like figures in mm -hmm. two first grade classrooms. And that means you can have two adults teachers in each of each classroom for the kids um, but then if you go to the two schools where you have three first grade classrooms at each um, it's not the same ratio so my question is would you is should we think about two more ESP so that at all of our first grades we have access to having two teachers in each classroom two adults so then you'll have, you'll never make it equal. Because at that point, then the, the schools with three will have more support than the schools with two. So I, I think, you know, we try to achieve equity. If you look through the budget book, you'll see that things are actually pretty equalized across the schools, but it can never be perfect because, you know, it's, it just can't. Every school is different and you can only, uh, split positions I'm, so many ways. And I'm, I fully appreciate that. I guess, do those first grades only have one special ed teacher, though, if you have three um, yes. classes? Yes. So um, I would argue in that case that it's something to think about because we've heard from so many parents where the first grade classrooms have problems and not having enough adults in those classrooms. And so what I just proposed with two extra, potential extra mm -hmm. ESPs, pretty much gives you that. And those schools that would have a little bit extra ESP have less of a special ed teacher, it sounds like. So, I mean, I'm not trying to, it's apples and oranges in some ways, but it's numbers of adults in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Remember leaving, then I'll come back. 
So to follow that, I think for me as I think about what information will be helpful in, in understanding the, the additions and the cuts, I, I go back to one of the comments I made last meeting, which is that to really understand the, the idea of cutting the special ed teachers, I would want to know that our students and our teachers are being, are, are being and feeling successful um, such that we can afford to lose these adults. And when I measure success, I really want to have some information on behavior. And I know that there, there are things that aren't being measured, and so I'm, I'm hopeful that you can, you can bring information that would help us get a sense of what's happening behaviorally in those classes that would allow, or in those schools where the, where the, where the special ed teachers are, gonna, are being proposed to be cut, that, that would make it okay that those adults would, would, would not be in those spaces. And I guess I, I wanna kind of follow that theme through the other areas where I have questions. In thinking about the, the project Lead the Way teacher and that proposed addition, for me, what would be helpful to hear would be the, the rationale behind that proposal. If the rationale is really that it's gonna increase equity and access, I, I would really strongly encourage some data to show that that would do so without creating a further segregation um, when we look at honors AP classes versus uh, something like a Project Lead the Way class. In looking at the um, the SEL coach, you've made mention that coaching is really, really effective. And given the feedback that that I've received, and I think we've all received from teachers about about their questions about the the efficacy of a, a SEL coach, I would I would really want to see um, how much time would this coach be able to spend with each teacher. And what would the, and maybe this is gonna be in the, in the job description, what would, the, what would the impact be on the teacher's ability to handle behavioral, social, emotional issues that come up in the classroom, given the coaching model? And then I, I think for the family student engagement, similar, I think the job description would help, but what's the intended impact of that position? Sure. Uh, Jim? I just want to respond to a couple of those things. Um, I think f with respect to your first question about students and teachers feeling very successful or, or data around that, I'm just going to say I don't think I have the same level of data that I have around um, achievement. And I, especially historical, forget about that. Um, this is what I hear, and I hear enough that I believe it's more than, than anecdotal. I hear teachers saying that they're struggling with behaviors in their classroom. And so I don't think they're feeling as successful as they could. And that's what I'm trying to address through the coaching. Um, so there's, there's that. Um, this wasn't related to what you said, but something you said triggered it. And it's getting back, I think, to, to um, your, your original questions, Member Voss. Um, so much of what drove this sort of in the interim goal phase that we're in right now is the district review. Because what I had said from the beginning of the process of the district review like 18 months ago is the findings from this review should inform our next district improvement plan. So I had hoped that I would have them earlier so that we'd have the district improvement plan already ready to go for this budget, but we don't. But I can't imagine that we will be coming up with a new district improvement plan that doesn't at least address what was shown in the, in the district review. We might have other things in there, and we might address those in other years. But I think we know what some of the core deficiencies are, as well as some of the core strengths that we want to continue to build on. And so when we were thinking about goals for this budget, we were really leaning on the district review as sort of the precursor document to what the next district improvement plan is likely to look like. So we did that. And then the other thing that just sort of um, flashed through my mind, and it's something that I think is important. I, I say this all the time when I'm talking to people about strategic planning, which I have been trained in. I mean, I would say probably the first 10 or 15 years of my career was all strategic planning. Um, 
but it's also important to remember this planning principle that no plan survives first contact, right? And so once you develop your plan, you also have to be improvising and, and responding to needs that you see right in front of you that might not actually be in a plan. One of the main examples of that is WINS. WINS wasn't in a district improvement plan, but we ended up going in that direction because of what we were seeing as the emerging needs at the time, which at that time was again student behavior. And the, the question that actually sparked the WINS model was one principal saying in the budget process, my teachers would really like to have two teachers in each classroom, is that possible? Um, and that's what, through all the different series of discussions, led to the WINS model. So, um, so not, I guess well, that's to say, we do have a sense of the direction because we have the district improvement plan, but we also, I always feel, can't be completely bound by a plan because you can't, no one has a perfect crystal ball into the future. Can I just follow that, that, that last point you made with another ask for data? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry that this sure. list is getting longer. Sure. I think for me, I think it would be really helpful if, if, and you could point me to if this already exists, um, if I could get a sense of with this proposed, um, these proposed additions and proposed cuts, um, how many adults will be in each classroom? Like per grade, per school. That would be really helpful to see. Okay. Be and then come back to uh, but I agree, it'd be great to have sort of a snapshot. I'm having a hard time wrapping my head around what the classrooms will look like with these proposed addition cuts. So I just want to say ditto to that. But also I'm wondering on the social emotional coach, if that's one, one person, one full-time person, are they only in the elementary schools, six through 12? How, how do you see that playing out? Elementary and middle, just like our academic coaches okay. are. I think you so, did answer that last that's, time. I mean, that's why it'll be easy for me to get what their schedules would look like. They'd be basically following the same schedules that our academic coaches follow, and they'd be working with different content. Member Kaufman. Can I raise my hand? <laughs> um, Member Kaufman's next, and then I'll come right to you. Okay, Member Condon. Uh, uh, Dr. Provost, thank you for, for, <laughs> for this budget. Uh, I, I want to chime in that, I, like other members, uh, have concerns about the special ed cuts. But I, I do want to say I, I see real value in the uh, social emotional learning coach position being added. Uh, I think, as as you mentioned, and maybe it's it's not been loud enough. I think with the limited amount of professional development time in the district. Uh, while that coach might not solve all of the problems, uh, I think that person has the potential to indirectly touch many students by getting out into classrooms and helping those teachers. So I, I do see value in that. Uh, and similarly with the, the family engagement position, uh, I know you're working on uh, kind of a, a job description for that, which which probably will, will better answer a lot of questions regarding it. Um, a lot like the SEL coach, uh, it's not a, a magic bullet, but I think it's a right step in addressing some of the equity issues that many people are concerned with. Thank you. And I'll stop there. Okay. Actually, so now you have a comment. And then a, a comment about goal setting, but in terms of the, the other thing, um, with these two and a half positions in SPED, it, it's easy to respond and go, this doesn't work. And then you look at the numbers, and I, I don't know, it's, it, the numbers in caseload, I, I don't think that's cut and dry. There's a lot of factors to it. I think for me, the thing that might be most important is the people that proudly advocated for this, and I'm, I'm suggesting probably if we hear from the three principals, this cuts across three schools, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Doesn't it? I mean, I would love to hear from them. What do they see as the benefits versus the concerns? Have they talked to their staff? Do they? Why do they feel confident? Um, I think they would have a, a view that we haven't heard yet. So maybe I'll just point that out as a possibility. Sure. I haven't talked about that. Um, I just want to get back to what you said about goals, uh, about our goal setting, because as you know, I've been talking about this for a while, and I've never been so optimistic. And one of the reasons I'm so optimistic is because I think so many of these new 
newer people on the school committee as well as um, some existing people are up, want this. And when I say this, I, I, I don't know if we're even talking on the same page, to tell you the truth, but if we don't, if we, this budget is a perfect example, and I, as much as I, I told you last time how I greatly appreciate you aligning this with, with the district review, and you did a fantastic job aligning this to, to, to give us reasons, it, it still looks like a bunch of positions and a bunch of changes that all look good, well, many look good, but I, it's so hard to know how it's tied to where we're going and what initiative we're funding and what what we're moving towards and some of the things that we're working on like um, like the new the, the new uh, code of conduct and standard space grading which again you know I love both of those initiatives but I just love those initiatives I don't know how it supports other things and the problem with that is that we have no way of measuring we have no way of knowing if it's successful and we can't do everything so coming up with a concrete sort of plan gets us there. And so when you say that we have to be open, absolutely we have to be open to adding, changing, whatever. But that's what a plan does. It revisits itself often and it has to be open to it. So I don't think we're talking about two different things. But the other reason I'm optimistic is first of all, the district improvement plan is gonna happen. It's actually part of your, part of your goal this year, right? Mm -hmm. If you have the time to get to it, <laughs> well, we have to get to it soon. Um, we, I, I just want to bring this up because I told my colleagues last year I would, so I feel obligated. We passed a new policy last year, uh, it was policy DB, and it has it's called annual budget, and I'm not sure I have the exact words, but I'm pretty sure I do. It says, I'll just one, one sentence, the annual budget is the financial expression of the education program of the school department and it reflects the goals and objectives of the school committee to meet the needs of all students. And when we passed that last year, I made it a point to tell my colleagues that we're not talking about goals in the way we've always talked about goals, that the budget needs to reflect the goals of the school committee, which we all know we set, we established educational goals for the, for the school department. So we're not doing that this year, and I, and I totally agree with Mr. Member Voss why we can't, we don't have the time. But we need to do that next year. We need to have educational goals in place. We need to make sure that that responds to the district improvement plan. We need uh, to make sure it responds, as you've said eloquently, to the district review, which is only gonna capture some of the standards that we need to, so it'll be above and beyond that. But I just think that amongst all the great things we do, the one thing we're missing, and the one thing that I, I would, because I read the district review and then cited probably in 40 or 50 different parts of the review, how we don't measure our success and we don't plan accordingly. And I think that's one of the underlying things. So I, I know I'm preaching to the choir for many of you, but I just feel like I understand why we can't do that this year, but our, I maintain tremendous optimism that we will get there next year. We just need to make sure that we're focused on that and the district review will be the center point that's I think gonna keep us together on aligning where we're going. Member Voss. Okay. Um, thank you. What I, I agree. So um, I, I think what Mr. Hoffman just articulated is really important, and I just want to add to it that I, I think I share this, looking at this and trying to think about it in, in the future in terms of goals that we're going to set, and I don't know how to think about this, but I just want to put it out there that I want us thinking not just like, what additions and cuts do we need this year and how are we going to balance the two columns and the same thing for next year but I want a bigger picture and one of the platforms I ran on for this seat and one of the things I'm continuing to think about is and you know I'm going to be careful how I say it but we, we're going to have contract negotiations again and I want us to think about those before the year of them and I don't know how we have those conversations, but I want to have them. And as a group, I hope we can figure out how to have them. Because if we make decisions in this budget, it's going to affect what happens in succeeding years. And we might want to do all of these additions, but I'm not totally sure which ones we can afford, both in terms of the cost and also in terms of what we're reducing. I'll second that that I, I also um, have been thinking a lot about 
uh, about our need to come together on specific goals to ensure that we're on the same page about what we're planning for now and in the future and to ensure that we're creating space for us to be able to achieve those goals including supporting our teachers with with a salary increase if if we can figure that out in the budget but that but that requires a goal conversation and i think we need to do that sooner rather than later but not for this budget member gold um last thing i'll throw out there for the night for the scl coaching and i think it was member uh, Kaufman had mentioned like having the principals come in and share. Um, I'd be interested to hear from the, if possible, in gathering evidence like from the existing ELA and math coaches, um, how they see their impact and, and what's the evidence of their impact and how that works for them. Um, it's, uh, you know, being a coach myself, uh, imagining being shared amongst those schools, amongst multiple schools. I know coaches that do it and it's possible, but it comes with challenges. And so, just what is the infrastructure that he, we have here to make it make that a, a worthwhile endeavor, where you're shared about across multiple schools? And so, if they were able to come in and share how they could see that, and you know how we could see this is what it would look like for an SEL coach, just different content. I think that would help us all in understanding how that how that comes about. Okay, so we're at 10.30. Someone had mentioned a goal of 10.30. I was, I was uh, really excited about that goal. Um, so is there anything else uh, for tonight? Um, sure. Yes. What is the start time brainstorm meeting on March 26th? That was a... Was that a pre-meeting meeting? That was a meeting that was developed out of discussion at one of the full school committee meetings, where I think it was the one where my latest late start plan went down in flames, <laughs> uh, where uh, the, the suggestion was to have a short period of time just for pure brainstorming. The idea, I'm glad you asked the question because we actually discussed this last night I too. I was gonna bring it up, the, the, something maybe to add. The, the idea for this meeting is just to do pure brainstorming. So we want everyone to bring ideas. We'll also have RJ there, we'll have Tammy there. And just any, con any kind of crazy idea you think you have about how we could achieve a late start at the high school. We've achieved, to find the late start in other documents is eight o'clock or later, right? And so different ideas. And we're not gonna analyze, we're not gonna debate, we're just gonna list. And then that will become the raw material that the budget and property subcommittee can use to work at, towards its goal of developing the two or more proposals to bring next fall for a vote. Thank you. So this is a school, this is a school committee meeting or a community meeting? It's, a, it's school a school committee meeting, yeah. Can I add to that? Sort of like the norms one we had earlier. Yep. So we will have Tammy Lieber, our transportation director there, and RJ from our transportation company. That regional, we Northeast Regional, or New England yeah. Regional Manager. And we only have 45 minutes in that meeting, so the idea was to, you know, that they come with a lot of expertise, and RJ serves a lot of different districts and might have seen a lot of other models and we're well, only have 45 minutes and that we want to just make sure that we get to sort of uh, get ideas from them as well and then our next budget and property meeting is on april 15th at 4 30 p.m and we are going to double post that meeting as a budget and property subcommittee committee meeting and a school committee meeting so that everyone can attend and we can continue to brainstorm since that first meeting was only 45 minutes with two invited guests. So can you say that date again? Yep, April 15th at 4.30 p.m. And we'll double post it. Where will, sorry, where will that? The mayor's idea that with a hot button issue, we can do that so everyone can participate. Will the April 15th meeting also be in this space? Thank you. Just a thought. Um, it strikes me as as a little bit mutually exclusive the ability to have a brainstorming session and also to have experts in the room we're having a brainstorming session where we're just throwing out ideas to just throw them out with no judgment comment is it is it valid is it doable we're just getting our ideas out there and then having the experts in the room to share 
what is doable or their ideas. It seems like maybe those need to be two separate conversations. Well, I had sort of remembered from yesterday's meeting, but I've got my, I have everyone in the room from it, was that the meeting, uh, the brainstorming meeting actually really was just to get the expertise from the two invited guests and that then we would can, we would do more of our school committee, let's throw out all of our ideas. Before we would come with more questions. Uh, that's my memory, but anyone can. That's my me. memory too, and I think we did express it was a short time and what did it mean, and I think we could certainly change our minds, but um, it sounds like our job in Durham might have some experience just knowing the busing, so I would say we should prioritize saying to him, what can you tell us about how he knows our bus routes to some extent. What can you tell us about ideas you have and hope maybe get him to brainstorm? And then if there's time, maybe we could do the more traditional brainstorming. But that would be what I would recommend and mm -hmm. I don't think it's enough time to do it all. Mm -hmm. so. tell, me, tell me if you think this is backwards, but it almost strikes me as, as constricting to do it that way. Yeah. Whereas if we started with the creative brainstorming and then brought in the bus people, they could, rather than being constricted by their ideas, they could look at our ideas and, and give feedback on what's doable based on their knowledge. Um, I thought from what we were saying last night in the conversation, it was like them, they being the experts of it, like they were gonna brainstorm for us first and then we were, you know what I mean? Like rather than us try to fish around to come up with the ideas, RJ and Tracy would be the ones to present their expertise and then allow us to now weigh those options and, and see what fits us. I think that's what the thinking is. Like first, let, let's hear from the folks who do this versus us I, who are trying to figure it out. I, I hear you. So what do you recommend? I, my sense is RJ is coming for other reasons that day. Mm -hmm. So we have a meeting on the book, and we have RJ in town able to come to the meeting. And given that constraint, should we try to have a different meeting? Should we 